What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome to Reborn a Soccer with A Gamer Interface, Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Wish. Sokka's spear cut through the air, creating a whip-like sound as the space in front of him seemed to crackle. He was in the Royal Fire Nation ship that Azula resided in. Some people were looking at him as he trained, and while he wasn't bothered by them, it was quite annoying since he couldn't train other skills here. But he was waiting for Azula's order. It won't take long for her to notice that having him on the ship is just wasting his potential. Sokka initially wanted to have her give him an order to go and spy somewhere but he wondered if he had assumed her intelligence too much. After all, keeping a spy close to you is like having a brick of gold that you never cash out. It's useless. Azalo on the deck of the ship was also training, as lightning crackled around her. Guam lighting kept shooting to the sky, as she tried to manipulate the Kai around her to make lightning move in an arc. That way, anyone who touched her would be zapped. In her mind, she was fighting against an imaginary enemy with a spear. That was Kuzan. He truly showed her a new world of fighting in their short spa. Sometimes, some people would be able to dodge her fire. Earth and water bending were also very effective as a defense against fire bending. But that would be easily offset by lightning. She needed to be able to summon lightning at her fingertips with only a thought. Crackle. Her hair seemed to defy gravity as she moved through her moves, and the Kai in her bot clashed into positive and negative. Lighting was called cold-blooded fire, and it required someone to have extreme control of their emotions, mind, and body. Tai Li looked on from the sidelines and smiled. Mai who was next to the gymnastic girl looked at her strangely. Azala is special, said Tai Li. How many people do you think can use lightning like that? I doubt even the Fire Lord can. Mai's eyes sharpened. Don't say such things out loud. If anyone hears it, Azalo will be the one to execute you. Tai Li pouted clearly unconvinced. But it's the truth. Her talent is amazing, and she is still at an age where she can experience the best growth. The Fire Lord has already peaked. This annoyed Mai, she might agree with that. But it wasn't something she wanted to be said out loud. To anyone else, it would seem like they were mocking the Fire Lord. I agree with that. Suddenly another voice got in the conversation. Tai Li almost jumped once she heard it. Her instincts were quite good, and she could sense when someone was close. But Sokka had sneaked right behind her, as he kept gazing at Azula with a smile on his face. Her talent is undeniable, and she could be the greatest firebender in the last thousand years. Of course, excluding the Avatar. Jumping down from where they were standing, Sokka casually landed on the ground where Azula was training. She was in a trance, practicing her lighting rigorously and trying to shoot it out in an arc. Sokka wasn't worried as he walked out, and casually pulled out a knife made of metal from his pocket. You can try throwing some lightning at me. I will show you another weakness that lightning has. Even through the crackling Azula heard him, and while it would be dangerous to be close to her, while she was throwing around lightning bolts, if it was anyone else, they would have panicked and lost control of the lightning, either harming themselves or the person close to them. But Azula wasn't normal, so she casually did the perfect stance, stopping the lightning cracking around her and throwing it at the sky. Uom Sokka was amazed by it. Lightning was a very strong force, a feat of firebending that could make them the strongest out there. It was up there with blood or lava bending. You know, if you are suicidal, I don't think dying by electrocution is the best way to go. Azula joked, knowing that he could have stood next to her while she did that, and the lightning would have never gone out of her control. Sokka nodded, thinking about how to bring up the subject of having him work somewhere. He needed a reason to get out of here. Nah, I have been a little bored on this ship and have come up with an idea. Why don't you try shooting some lightning at me? Without an ounce of hesitation, lightning crackled at Azula's fingertips, and she shot it out. Sokka narrowed his eyes at the projectile and was able to tell that he wouldn't be able to dodge it at such a close range when the lightning bolt was already thrown. Still, he twirled the knife in his hand and threw it, having it land in the lightning bolt's way. Crackle. The lightning hit the shot deck below them, the sky above, and everywhere in the surroundings except soccer. This was due to the knife stopping the bolt of electricity midway. Maya looked at it from afar, surprised at how effective it was. I had thought of something similar before, but the resident lightning could still hit you, so it's a technique based on luck. Not an effective one. Though she said that, Mai couldn't help but wonder if Kuzan and did something different than her. Because it seemed like no matter what, the scattered lightning bolts weren't hitting him. Azula, I don't think that I am any good here, doing nothing. Every time we arrive at the Avatar's destination, he is already gone by the time we get there. Sokka made sure his explanation was on point, and tried to express that his abilities were more useful elsewhere. He wanted something from Azula, but if he told her what he wanted, 
That would make him suspicious and his efforts ineffective. This was all in an effort so Azula wouldn't catch on to what he was up to these days. Then, do you think you would be able to catch the Avatar? No, but I have noticed that you were preoccupied with something else. And we have never chased him on land. Something is happening, and I don't know about it. Azula smirked. But in the inside was a little unsure. Then I will use you. Though you might die. It doesn't matter. Sokka smoked in return. Let's just give it a roll. It isn't like there is someone to grieve for me. He had said that to give a reason why he was Phyllis. He wouldn't want her to start getting suspicious. I will be sad if you die. So please make sure to come back. You are my precious spy, after all. After saying that, Azla pulled out a small piece of paper and handed it to him. Making sure that no one else saw the contents. Do whatever you need to help me in any way. I trust your judgment. With that, she walked off to rest and get something to eat. Sokka opened the piece of paper and saw that it was orders from the Fire Lord to take over the Northern Water Tribe. This made Sokka chuckle. With Azula acting this way, it meant she didn't trust all of the people on the ship. Was there a spy? She seemed to have become more cautious lately. Maybe the Fire Nation wasn't as united as it appeared to the world. I can use that. Sokka then looked at an island close by and jumped off the ship. Azula yelled something at him, but he didn't hear it as he was already underwater and swimming like a fish towards the island. He equipped some new shoes that looked as if they were made of alligator skin and clicked them, teleporting away with a flash. Teleportation was a convenient ability to use, though the nausea that came with it is just as worse. Azula gazed at the water inside. He was now deep underwater and unseen by the normal eye. Why does he always jump off the ship? Mai entirely shrugged. The last time he had gone on a vacation, he had also jumped off the ship, when he could have taken a small boat at least. In the spirit world, Sokka was atop one of the mountains where he had fought the Nemean lion. Taking out a book from his pocket, which was too big to fit in his pockets, he started reading. Hum, there aren't a lot of spirits out there that suit my vision, he complained. Fwish. Suddenly, a sword burst out of his stomach and he looked down. His eyes widened. What? Sense danger hadn't even reacted. Before Sokka even knew it, he had been attacked. You are poisoned, you have been affected by bleeding, your wounds have become cursed due to an unknown curse. Your wounds are unable to heal a long-bearded man, twice the size of a normal human with a white blindfold over his eyes stood here. With his hand on the sword that had pierced Sokka, are you the one who has been changing fate? Manipulation of fate like that isn't something that can be done so carefreely, young man. Looking down, Sokka felt as if molten lava was spreading through his body. Was it the curse? Such a strange sensation he never felt before. Even as the pain was being cancelled by Gamer's body, it reignited instantly again due to the curse. You know, fate and luck are things that have balance. For every good thing that happens to a person, an equally bad thing must happen too. That's how things stay in balance. Said the old man, his white beard made him seem like a gentle and grandfatherly figure. But his actions told a different story. Sokka tried moving his body, but it was stuck in place as if the space around him was locked. He sighed, seeing that there was no way to get out. With that in mind, he decided to at least get some information. Why are you even after me, old man? I have no enmity with you or anyone that would want to kill me. His voice sounded innocent as if he truly didn't know why he was attacked. That made the old man frown. Was it right to kill someone who tilts the world's balance without meaning to? This was the age-old dilemma. Whether you should kill one person to save two. With no other choice on the matter, most people would choose to save the two guys. But what if those guys were criminals? They were serial killers. Even then, was it right for you to choose someone else's life or death? Many questions like that rattled the old spirit's brains. He contemplated how things could go, or what will become of it. Would letting Sokka go be a good option? Sokka on the other hand was trapped, he tried tugging. But there was no chance of movement. Luck could help during situations like this. But with a 0% chance. There was nothing even luck could interfere with. There was no way Sokka could play the situation to his advantage. He wanted to teleport away. But clicking his boots together was impossible too. Due to being unable to move. Still, since he wouldn't want to fight someone without having information. Hey, old man, how about you let me go? I have never done bad things in my life. I never even killed someone. Sokka's felt his heart come up to his throat as he said the last part. Because it wasn't the truth at all. Normally he would have never said something like that. Because it wouldn't be hard to guess that the old man had been observing him. Still, Sokka trusted in one thing that was his luck. Planning for when you are too successful in something. Sokka had been caught off guard when during the time of Zhao's blockade, the people seemed to listen to his words so clearly. Following as if he was their saintly savior. That time he had been unprepared. But now, he was fully prepared to try his luck. Test if the old man had been observing him at a bad time. Just like when the evil lady was taken by surprise with his bending not knowing initially. Sokka did something he never liked doing. He took a gamble. The old man's frown accentuated his wrinkles even more. He stood silent, and it made Sokka a little nervous. Maybe he shouldn't have tested things out. While having luck was good, relying on it too much would become a crutch. Though it wasn't like he had any other choice. You are right, the old man sighed. He had observed Sokka for quite a while. But not even once he had seen anything bad or even suspicious about the young man. He was good enough for the evil lady to take an interest in. She mostly killed off kind warriors who were non-benders. 
while conflict between spirits at their caliber was uncommon, and something that would only open a path for someone to kill them both. The old man didn't mind that Sokka killed the evil lady, he was even glad. Someone like her had nothing but evil and malice to offer to the world. Yet, the old man, he was the spirit of fate, someone who had a prophetic-like ability and could grasp small glances of the future. Even with the glances he got, there was no sign of Sokka doing something explicitly evil. In reality, he was just doing good things. Sigh kid, the old man rubbed his forehead trying to think of what to say. You are someone who I would look after if the circumstances were different. Good people like you restore my faith in humanity. But the world needs balance. And as the spirit of fate, I can tell that you were never supposed to be so fate-defying. Fate, something that was like a river. Throwing stones at it could cause ripples in it. But it wouldn't change the direction of the river. There have been some people who have been able to change their fate, essentially putting a dam and delaying things like their death, or the death of a loved one. But Sokka was different, he had changed the direction of the river. It was more than just digging a canal. It was as if he picked up the river and changed its direction. No, that wasn't it either. The whole river moved as if to benefit him. Fate sometimes wasn't kind to its owner, even when it was. There were usually repercussions. But for Sokka, it was different as if Lady Fate itself was spreading her legs for him. Even the old man, as the spirit of fate, wouldn't say that his fate was something he could control or have it flow how he wanted to. Ash Sokka POV. This old man was dangerous. His power should be somewhere around the evil lady's level, maybe a little weaker. But he seems to know about my high luck, so that was a little troubling. That means I have to kill him today, no matter what. The spirit of fate was a very grand name. He was probably called by another name too. But that didn't matter. Well, I had contemplated in the past if someone might notice my good luck. What would I do? Contemplating such situations could be done as speculation at most. Because I have no idea what kind of person they might be. Even spirits had many different qualities of personality. While I haven't learned a lot from the old man, he seemed like a kind spirit. His attack on me was only due to necessity. Forcing myself to yawn internally. Without opening my mouth, tears rolled down my cheek. Old man, please I I have a grandmother and sister to take care of. I promise not to interfere with the Avatar or the world anymore. I just wanted to help people before. Please don't kill me. My sister will always feel worried about what happened to me. To make yourself sincere. If you can, always make the situation or excuse about someone else. Saying it that way would make me seem more sincere. Also the reaction of yawning instinctively brings tears to your eyes. Okay, okay, let's come down first. I am not here to kill you. Says the old man, taking his sword off my belly, and applying some acupuncture with his finger to stop the bleeding. Do you think I'm stupid, stabbing me and then saying you weren't here to kill me? If I hadn't spoken, by now I would be dead. You fucking naive old man, doing only what you think is right and to keep balance. Many spirits have been trying to kill me lately. I am not going to just roll over and take it. You want balance? Well, you can have it the old man put a comforting hand on my shoulder. Well, I am sure we can work something out. If you live as a hermit dash wish. My spear cut through the air, and the old man's eyes widened, there was no longer a hand holding onto my shoulder. Click. I clapped my shoes and teleported away, just behind the old man's back. Clang. My spear seemed to hit an invisible steel wall, and the power behind my swing seemed to shake my spear. That vibration traveled up my arm. The old man turned around with a furious look in his eyes. You faked all that? No, because the best lies need a sprinkle of truth in them. But I won't tell him that, just in case anyone was listening in. When you want to kill someone you should be prepared to get killed. Click. I teleported once again this time to his side, and swung my spear at him again. Due to my high level in spear mastery, my spear moved so fast that it was invisible to the normal eye. Just as my spear was about to touch him, he extended his hand probably creating another invisible barrier. Click. But I teleported to his side and cut off his other arm. Though it was a spirit, the way his arm sloped to the ground was like that of a human. You lying brat! He yelled out as dark energy surrounded his form. Having only three uses left in his teleportation boots, Sokka contemplated running away. But abandoned those thoughts as soon as they came to mind. He didn't want an enemy like the spirit of fate scheming behind his back. If he didn't finish the old man off right now, Sokka knew it could lead to his death. That was something he wouldn't allow. While he understood that one day he might be killed by some stronger being, he still doesn't want to die due to making a wrong move. He would have no one else but himself to blame if that happened. Even now I can feel it, said the old man, looking at his arms, which were now just two bleeding stumps. Fate is moving in your favor. Even my river of fate is moving to your advantage. Just being close to you causes others' fate to move in a way that would deliver a good outcome for you. What a ridiculous thing. It's as if the world lived for you. As if you were the chosen one. What defines a hero? Or more correctly, someone who is chosen by the world. Was it talent? Power? No, it was luck. Having luck was the most important thing that would bring power and talent with it. The old man was having an existential crisis. He could understand more than Sokka what this meant. Everyone was the main character of their own story. But if Sokka came into your life, then he was the main character of your story too. My existence, being twisted to suit you this is disgusting. Yelled out the old man as his kind eyes shined red with malice, turning blood like color, as the dark energy around him was amplified a dozen times. 
Sokka was thrown away the mountain top just from the shockwaves of the energy. Bam, he smashed into the ground painfully as a crater was made around him, but his eyes stayed glued to the old man. He could sense the air around him turning malicious. Sokka felt like his skin was being pricked by needles. I don't understand exactly what you are talking about, but luck will always be on my side, old man. Even in your own story, you will become the villain and I the hero. Sokka said that to aggravate the old man even more. A strong enemy wasn't as dangerous as a smart one. He would rather fight the old man when he had more power than having self-consciousness and thinking clearly during the fight. Fwish. Within an instant, the old man had closed the distance between them. Sokka hadn't even had enough time to get up, much less dodge the attack. But now, unlike before, his sense danger skill warned him of the attack. Boom, a large dust cloud covered the area, as the ground crumbled upon itself like paper. The old man's leg had sunk knee deep into the rock, and his arms had regenerated. Though the new hands were covered in a shadowy, dark mist. Sokka on the other hand had dodged the attack by tilting his body just by a hair's breadth out of the attack. Though he was still hit by the shockwave, he had used that to move away. Now he understood why initially sense danger hadn't worked, because the old man initially didn't have any intentions of directly harming him. Even during spars, Sokka hadn't encountered something like that, but now he knew that the sense danger skill had a weakness. Old man, I don't know what has freaked you out so much, but once an enemy wants to kill me, I will never let them live, Sokka stated, showing that he doesn't plan to let the spirit of fate escape from here or run away. Today, only one of them would get out of this alive. Sokka clenched his teeth and his body lowered, clenching his spear in his hand. He had to finish this in one attack, because the more this battle goes on, the chances of him winning will decrease. Bullet time Sokka's running speed increased by 300%, but he didn't move an inch. The muscles on his legs clenched as a weird aura surrounded them. To end the battle within one attack, amongst Sokka's countless skills, one stood out. Chance hit level max the skill he had gotten when his luck reached 200 would allow him to always hit a target with 100% certainty. Though the skill could only be used once every 10 days. He knew this was the perfect chance to use it. Instinctively, all of Sokka's senses sharpened to their absolute limit, and he could feel his own heartbeat. The old man said something, but Sokka didn't hear him at all, as all of his concentration was in this one attack. During the battle, the old man had the advantage in speed, once his energy started becoming corrupted. But now, Sokka was the one blitzing him, as he disappeared from the old man's eyes like smoke. Fwish. The next thing the old man felt was a soft, tickling feeling passing through his neck, arms, midsection, legs, heart. After that, he heard Sokka breathe a sigh of relief behind him. That was when the spirit of fate understood what had happened. But it was too late now, and he tried to explode himself to take his enemy to the grave too. But it was too late as his arms slid off his shoulders, landing on the ground. The top of his head was sliced, and he was bisected. One by one, his body started falling apart, showing that he had already been cut by Sokka. Finally, I am at a level where I don't have to always grovel. Sokka breathed a sigh of relief, glancing at his opponent's corpse. But there was something strange why wasn't he getting a notification or experience points for killing the spirit of fate. Immediately Sokka was on guard, thinking that he hadn't killed his opponent, and had somehow been tricked. He stood like that for 10 minutes, keeping his senses sharp, like a knife. But then he sighed, and casually put his spear back into inventory. So that's how it is. There existed certain kinds of spirits in the world that were unkillable. Like Rava and Vatu. No matter what, as long as evil or good existed in the world, they would be there. The same could be said about the spirit of fate. As long as fate existed, he would be around. Though Sokka predicted that it would take at least a thousand years for the spirit of fate to reform again. He had read in the evil lady's books about spirits who had a similar existence to Rava and Vadu. The gamer interface only got experience points when they truly killed something, not in a roundabout way of killing them. Sokka though wasn't too bothered by it. While regretful, why worry about something you couldn't change? Instead, he made a promise to himself. These spirits had been getting in his way quite a lot. After this war is over, he planned to go and kill off all of them except the necessary ones. Unlike most people, Sokka didn't like taking things uninvolved. If you punch him, he will punch your family. With an unshakable resolve, he promised himself to kill off all the troublesome spirits. Sure, the balance might be important to others but why would it matter to him? He didn't care too much about the spirit world either. Sokka started walking, and the scenery around him seemed to change quite rapidly. The spirit world wasn't something that followed real-world physics laws. Distance sometimes didn't matter, and as long as you knew what you were looking for, then eventually, you would find it. It didn't take long for Sokka to arrive at an empty, desolate field. There were two white pillars on each side, that were intertwined and formed a half circle above ground. In the middle was a red, sinister looking tree. This was the place Avatar one sealed Vatu, the evil counterpart of Rava. Looking towards one of the portals, Sokka saw a forest on the other side. He created a water clone and made him go touch the portal. Buom but violent energy pushed the water clone away blasting him to a thousand pieces. As expected, muttered Sokka, having predicted something like this. But he usually tested things like this, just in case. He had wanted to get the cursed spear in the spirit world today, 
That was something he had gotten information about a while ago from his information gotcha. Though since he wasn't in his top condition and some important skills were on cooldown, Sokka decided to not risk it. What if there was some kind of dangerous spirit protecting the spear? He always tried to take into account details like that. Sometimes small details were the difference between life and death. Sokka didn't want to be in a dangerous situation because he acted without thinking things through. While passage to the other side of the closed portal seemed impossible, Sokka had a different idea, as he could see the forest on the other side, and was about to click his boots, which would allow him to teleport to a location which he could get a vision of in his mind, and have seen it before. But before he could get away from here, a dark, raspy voice from the malicious-looking tree called out to him. Young man I must say, your abilities are quite fascinating. Immediately, Sokka stopped and glanced towards the owner of the voice, Vatu. Young man I must say, your abilities are quite fascinating. Vatu. That was someone Sokka didn't plan to get involved with at all, anytime soon. The last thing he wanted was to have the creature be released from its prison prematurely. Hello there, sorry, but I don't have a lot of time right now. He teleported away, not hearing what one of the oldest and strongest spirits had to say. It would be just a waste of time. Also, Sokka planned to one day find a way to kill these so-called immortal spirits. Sealing Vatu wasn't a permanent solution to things, and neither was having the spirit of fate swimming in the river of fate, or whatever he was doing. Of course, Sokka didn't tell any of that to Vatu. Insinuating your plan, or bragging to your enemy was stupid. He would rather keep it to himself, and not even have Vatu be aware of what was going on. Sokka liked the more permanent kind of solutions but he didn't want the spirits knowing about his plans to kill off most of them. But for now, he wasn't worried about that as he teleported to a forest, and looking around, he smiled. He was in the North Pole. The forest around him was the one that exists due to the spirit portal. This place was filled with spirits too. At the same time, on the other side of the North Pole, Appa swam in the cold waters, while An, Katara, and Sokka's water clone looked around trying to see if there were any waterbenders. Katara, especially, was excited to finally find a waterbending teacher. This had been something she had waited ever since she could remember. Sokka's clone suddenly stands up and looks at the water, its eyes narrowing. How cold do you think these waters are? Very cold, Katara stated, raising her brow, confused pointing around. See the ice. That means it's cold, brother. Are you getting dumber each day or something? An heard Katara talk and whispered under his breath. She is becoming more like her brother with each passing day. Even his dry sarcasm is rubbing off on her. What? Katara heard his whispers and was outraged. She isn't like Sokka or at least that was what she liked to think. I am not like him. She pointed towards her brother, who was already mid-dive, and went on the water with perfect form. Katara just looked at the water as he sank under, and then glanced back at An. You see, he really jumped in the water. Not long after, he climbed back into App, shaking due to the cold. I feel like this is even colder than back home. Can you waterbend the water off my clothes, dear sister? No, learn from making such stupid mistakes. Come on, he whined. What if I catch a cold? Or high? hypothermia. Like many times before, his words caught into Katara's soft heart and with a sigh, she got all of the water off her clothes. Immediately, like always, Sokka ignored her and went towards An. So anyway, Mr. Avatar, how is your waterbending training going? I will show you how mine is going, said Katara, creating a water ball and ready to douse her brother in water again. But luck wasn't on her side as suddenly, all of the water around Appa froze, and some dozen men in small boats came forward. Who goes there? The looks on their faces were fierce and ready to attack. Sokka immediately walks to where they can see him and puts his hands up with a harmless smile on his face. Sorry for bothering you, everyone. But can you tell us where the Northern Water Tribe is? He grabbed Arn and pulled him up so everyone could see him too. We have the Avatar with us, and we need a waterbending master for him. The men narrowed their eyes in suspicion at first but then nodded when Arn blasted a blob of air, creating a gentle wind around. They nodded, with stern looks still on their faces. A stern middle-aged man, who seemed to be in charge, pointed towards two of the other boats. Yes, we will welcome the Avatar. They will lead you back, we still have a patrol to continue. Some weird things have been happening around here. Huh, weird. I don't think that happened in the show. Sokka kept the smile on his face, but was ready to pull out his spear, and cut anything that might seem troublesome. He could guess who was behind this weirdness, but decided to still keep his gut up. Azala was very different from Zhao, and her attack on the Northern Water Tribe would be different too. He felt a little excited just thinking about the things she might scheme. For now, Sokka wasn't playing as Kuzan, and had to fight against Azala. Mostly intellectually, and he couldn't go on the offensive, had limited forces, and the Northern Water Tribe soldiers might not even listen to him. To others, this might sound like a disadvantage, but to Sokka, it sounded like an intelligence and wisdom stat grind. He had to try very hard to stop his excitement from showing, as he knew that Azala was no dummy. In the original series she took down Ba Seng Si without a real army. But now she has won the biggest army in the world at her side. Appa was slowly escorted towards the Northern Water Tribe, and the group finally caught sight of the ice walls. That kept this Water Tribe safe for a hundred years. Sokka on the other hand stared at them with melancholy. The Southern Water Tribe, unlike the Northern, was poor, 
and after the war, people might have to move out and work in other places, outside of the tribe, just to get food. This was the harsh reality of the world. While he hadn't read the Avatar comics in depth about what had happened after the story, Sokka knew that the people of the Southern Water Tribe were left quite poor. Finally, those explained YouTube videos have become quite useful here. Small details like this became more prominent in memory the longer I stayed here, as everything around will remind me of them. As they entered the walls, Arn and the others expected at least a normal, nonchalant greeting at worst. But instead, they were surrounded by waterbenders ready to encase them in ice. Wait, wait, one of the people from the boats waved at them. I think this avatar might be the real deal. He used airbending. Are you sure of that? An old man came forward with hands behind his back. Sokka immediately recognized him as Paku, Arn and Katara's waterbending master. The first time we believed the avatar came back, Elder Hanzo got killed. It didn't take long for Sokka to figure out what Azula was playing at. She had already sent some fake avatars this way, and since the Northern Water Tribe didn't have too much contact with the outside, as long as the person was bored and had some air nomad tattoos, it would fool them. Elder Hands was probably some kind of important government personnel. That was all that Sokka could gather from such a short conversation. Um, show a new friends that you are the avatar. He didn't hesitate and used airbending, creating a gentle wind with small movements. Then he gathered a water ball and made it float between his hands. Everyone had their eyes on him, except Sokka, as his gaze wandered towards a silver-haired woman riding on a boat down the river canals. With two guards and a waterbender with her, the real avatar's arrival spread like wildfire throughout the Northern Water Tribe and hosted a feast for him. Though the grand feast was also made to celebrate the 16th birthday of Princess Yu, the banquet was held at the big palace, and Sokka was attending too. Arn and Katara looked at him strangely, because even though he wasn't supposed to know how to act cordially, Sokka seemed to strangely be in his element. So you are the avatar's companion? Asked Arnok, smiling at the young man. The tribe chieftain had drunk a little and loosened up. Today is a glorious day for our tribe to have the avatar amongst us. Sokka nodded. Of course, I am happy too. Though from what we have seen the Northern Water Tribe won't be safe for long. Immediately, the happy and glamorous atmosphere during the banquet quieted down. Sokka smiled and wondered if he had some talent in running everyone's mood. Why might that be so? Inquired Arnok as his eyes settled on him like a hawk. They want the avatar dead. Sokka clarified, taking a cut of tea and gulping it down in one swing. He never liked alcohol too much even in his first life, so at this party, he only drank tea. Though he drank it as if it was a shot of whiskey, most people here thought he was drinking alcohol. After the airbending avatar dies, do you know where the cycle leads next? Water. It's safe to assume that it won't be long before they attack. Arnok nodded and sighed. You are probably right. But if they attack, we will be prepared to fight against them. Right. And you have no idea how they fight for the last hundred years. Or what ships they even use. You might mean those words you say, chieftain, but to me they are empty. Sokka didn't trust Arnok's judgment, but decided not to voice his opinion out loud. And just gave a toast with a small smile on his face. Then let's hope that when they are here, we can fight together as a group. Trying to fend off the chieftain with words would be useless. Sokka knew that to them, he was just a snot-nosed brat from what they considered a savage and backward tribe. The feast went on, and Sokka was back to being in the background, letting Arn stand in the spotlight. His gaze settled on the chieftain for a split second before he looked away. Technically, Arnok was the one in charge of the Southern Water Tribe too. But Sokka would never let someone else, an outsider, rule his lands. Spending a hundred years apart, without contact, no one in the Southern Water Tribe would accept someone who will come and say that they will now rule them after abandoning them for a hundred years. Titles don't give you the power to rule over someone, only of it, like a shadow on the wall. Sokka would make sure that no one obstructed his way to the chieftain of the Southern Water Tribe. He glanced at you and smiled, though she wasn't looking at him. Ash Sokka POV what's the best way to sway the opinion of a leader who has to listen to his people's complaints and work based on them? Well, charm his daughter and have her put that idea in his mind. You had quite an exotic look, with blue eyes, silver hair, and light caramel skin. She would become a beauty, no doubt. Will I be able to get on her good side? Who knows, sometimes feelings aren't logical, so they can't be calculated. But the first step was important, and that was talking to her. The chances might be low, even if you try. But without trying then the chances are truly zero. Walking towards her quietly, I went and sat down next to you as a girl sitting there previously got up to do something. Excuse me. Do you have fried octopus? I asked, masking my real intentions. Starting to flirt with her immediately would just make you and everyone else who saw us think that I was just another scummy guy. She probably had a lot of guys trying to act like that towards her, since she was, after all, comma zero the chieftain's daughter. She glanced at me, and I noticed the intriguing look in her eyes. Hum, she wants to know more. It isn't every day she meets someone from the outside, especially someone from the avatars group that has traveled the world. A girl her age must be curious about the outside world. Here are the fried squids. Someone handed me a plate, and I took it, putting the plate in front of me. I used that as an excuse to sit down next to her. So, I heard that you're a princess. 
Now my next words will either break or make the relationship. You don't look like one. What is that supposed to mean? She narrowed her eyes. Well, at least I had her attention now. Where I come from there is a story of a princess falling in eternal sleep, and only the kiss of true love could save her. Romantic right? I guess no. That's creepy. Would you want an older guy to come and kiss you while you sleep? And he already loves you when he doesn't know anything about you. That's even more ludicrous. My hand gestures and story made you chuckle. Though she tried to hide her laugh, as that would be unprecedented behavior from a princess. It seems like outsiders have very interesting stories, she said politely, with a nice smile on her face, which I could see was very fake. But that uncontrollable chuckle from before was real. So now that she had come down, I told her the premise of another story. Do you know about the story of a princess who kissed a prince that had been turned into a frog? Oh, I know about that one, exclaimed you excitedly. But she immediately calmed herself down, and fakely coughed in her hand to try and get rid of the embarrassment. That's what I'm talking about, you don't seem like a princess. I can't imagine you going around kissing frogs. I told you some stories about Disney fairy tales, and how ridiculous they were when thought about logically. Always telling the romantic part first, and the truth later seemed to amuse and surprise her. This was like a semi-date, though neither of us would call it that. From the corner of my eye, I noticed Hans staring at me with an angry look in his eyes. Tough luck buddy. But I need you for something and you're just in the way. He was her betrothed, not like that was going to stop me. In my first life, the first time I spent with a woman, she was married. Not my proudest moment. But in my defense, I was a late bloomer. If a relatively pretty woman throws themselves at an inexperienced man, they will start thinking with their lower head. Though I did feel guilty later on when they divorced, not for the adults, but the children that would have to go through their parents' separation. Looking at my cup, I wondered if coming to this world had changed me. Here, I was, charming another rich guy's daughter to get what I want. Damn soccer, is something wrong? Asked you worryingly, putting a hand on my cheek and making me look at her. Her worried eyes and gentle expression overlapped with another woman for a split second. Fuck. Naive and nice people will always be taken advantage of in this world. The underdogs are beaten down, used, pumped, and dumped. It almost made me feel guilty for using her. Well, that didn't mean I couldn't develop feelings for her later on. Maybe this time, we could have a happy ending. No, I was never foolish enough to try and wash things I regret in the past. Something that had already happened can't be changed. It was about time to stop thinking about a past life I could change nothing about and start looking forward to the future. I can't change the past, but I can stop myself from making the same mistakes. Well, Han was walking towards us too, so I couldn't stay daydreaming of what could have been. That guy seemed to want to punch my lights out. Soccer and you spend a lot of time talking with each other, and it doesn't take long for a group of other girls to gather around the table. He was telling them stories of his adventures with the Avatar that was somewhat true, but he was using his acting skill to great impressions, and showing how the scenes played out. That drew deep emotions from them. Katara observed from the sidelines, narrowing her gaze suspiciously. In her eyes, Sokka already had a girlfriend, Suki, and now he seemed to be playing around with other girls. Others might not notice, but the way he looked at you, touched her hand and smiled at her. Everything pointed towards him wanting to be with the Northern Water Tribe's princess. Katara didn't approve of such behavior, feeling sorry for Suki, but there isn't anything she can do about it. With a regretful sight, she goes back to looking at the waterbending performers. This way, she could at least learn something. Yu was having the night of her life as she laughed and smiled more than she had ever done in her life. Sokka's exaggerated stories seemed to have a sense of anxiousness and comedy about them, as he described the dangerous events during their journey. So I looked Xiao in the eye and trembled in fear. His gaze shakes as he looks at the ground. The commander has fallen just like that, not long after, many Fire Nation soldiers followed up. Sokka's story was interrupted as Han, Yu's betrothed, walked up to them with a furious look in his eyes. You never looks or laughs at me like that. This southern savage comes here and tries to seduce my future wife in front of me. Han put a hand on Sokka's shoulder as he was sitting down. Hey, I think this is enough for tonight. You is my betrothed. It's not finalized yet. You intervened, looking at Sokka as if she had to explain something to him. Han felt his heart burn with an icy fury. Anyone would be able to tell that you had a crush on Sokka already. This bitch. We are betrothed and she immediately goes for another man as soon as the opportunity shows itself. Sokka got up, brushing Han's hand that was on his shoulder to the side. He then smiled and put his hand on Han's shoulder. Hey now, there is no need to be angry. I and you are just friends. Are you insecure enough that she can't even hang out with some friends? That was the excuse any cheating spouse would use on their partner. Sokka held his smile and didn't show any sign of aggression, but he didn't show fear either. Han knew that if he provoked the man in front of him, then his opponent wouldn't be afraid of a fight. Ash Sokka POV Han. Han, Han poor guy. I was about to get his betrothed, and there wasn't anything he could do about it. This was related to feelings, not something that could be changed so easily. You might have been okay with marrying him before, as it was expected of her, but feelings changed as time passed. Most marriages that ended in divorce started with love. People that divorced thought that they had met their soulmate initially. Life wasn't all roses, sadly. Love wasn't some eternal magical feeling, either. 
Things get monotone even in a loving marriage. Someone might be pushed to cheat just to spice things up a little. Yu was a no-brainer on this one. She didn't even love Han, and just was betrothed to him due to obligation. Han clenched his teeth as he brushed my hand aside and walked away. Remember to come to warrior training tomorrow. I would love to teach you how we... The Northern Water Tribe Warriors fight. Was that supposed to be intimidating? Sure. See you there. I kept smiling at him, as if I didn't understand his threat. Having him explain what he meant by saying that would make Han look stupid. He didn't take my bait, so I continued. The Warriors can teach me a lot, and I can teach you guys a lot too. As I sat back down, you looked at me worriedly and asked. Are you okay? Yu's gentle demeanor was a contrast to the other girl around the table, who kept looking at Han walking away with dagger-like gazes pointed at his back. ECH, Han is such an idiot. Yeah. I don't like him anymore. He came all the way here just to run away. The girls started whispering among themselves, criticizing him. There were some harsh things said that made me feel bad for the poor guy who am I kidding. I was going to entice the hell out of these flames and make this situation bigger than it was. Sorry Han, but you don't pick fights with guys like me. I go for under the belt hits and break every unspoken rule there was. Yes, I am okay. Grasping Yu's hand. I reassured her. Surprisingly her hands were cold even though it was warm inside the building. And she was wearing clothes that protect against the chilly weather. Did this have something to do with her having been given life by the moon spirit? The other girls looked on with jealousy and started whispering, probably bad things about you. Sigh girls and their jealousy. There were some good ones out there. But if they were good, they wouldn't have crowded over me like this. Most of them were here because I was the Avida's companion. And Arn was already surrounded by intimidating officials. So they couldn't get close. Excuse me. I have to go to the bathroom, you said, probably having heard the harsh words the girls were talking about. But as she got up, she suddenly stumbled and fell forward straight into me. As her body landed onto mine, I was pushed on the ground with her on top of me, and with everyone now looking at us. The first thought that came to mind as she sat on my stomach, you was heavier than she looked. I could barely breathe and felt like throwing up. Thankfully due to Gamer's body that sensation was quickly gone, and I didn't throw up. But her heaviness still weighed on my body. Suki did it better, she sat a little lower even though she was probably a little heavier than you. Around 7 kilograms, 15 pounds, heavier. Even though they should be around the same height. Suki was probably heavier due to her muscle composition, as she did a lot of physical training, unlike you. Welp, it was about time I did something that proves to others that I am not some kind of manipulator. After all, you was a princess, and people could easily assume that I had some negative intentions, and might be manipulating her. Unlike Sokka, the princess was deeply embarrassed as her face flushed like a tomato, and she froze. What can she do? Should she get up, move, change positions, apologize? By the time she was done overthinking things, seconds passed by, and everyone saw their escape position. The first one to speak was Sokka. You're heavier than you look. You paled, and without thinking, slapped him, getting up and running away. Katara stared at him as if he was stupid. You and your mouth, she whispered under her breath. Sokka only looked around confused, touching his cheek. Why did she slap me? Some just awkwardly coughed while some others went back to drinking. All of them with one thought in their mind. What a naive guy. Katara could read the atmosphere and she frowned. While she called her brother worse things than naive, she didn't want others to think bad or insult her brother behind her back. Sokka on the other hand got up and went out of the party to get some fresh air. By now everyone ignored him. After this incident it showed that his relationship with you was unredeemable. On top of that, he seemed quite naive in romantic relationships. Katara sighed and followed her brother, making sure that he didn't have his feelings hurt or anything. Plus, if she stayed here, she might freeze the faces of everyone here that was looking down on her brother. Once outside, Sokka's gaze went from a confused and naive boy to that of a tiger. Even his posture changed from a little crouched to straight tall and sharp like a knife. The atmosphere around him changed completely. What annoying old man. Katara who was following him secretly caught sight of this, and her eyes widened in shock as her hands covered her mouth. What is this? It feels like Sokka's demeanor changed in a split second, and he became a different person. By using map Sokka was able to find where you was, and how to get there by using some hidden shortcuts. Following the hidden tunnels and sneaking past any guards, he arrived at a place that was familiar from the original show. The Spirit Oasis, a strangely lush cave with plants, which contradicted the cold nature of the Northern Water Tribe. Yu had a sad look in her eyes as she gazed at the pond, where two fish were circling each other. Sokka paused a little, standing at the entrance, looking at the pond for a couple of seconds, his brows frowning. Though he wasn't using his observe skill, due to the experience fighting spirits. He knew that if he fought against the moon or ocean spirit, he would lose. Their power was so enormous that it felt like a worm was crawling up his spine, and a tsunami crashed on him. Then he remembered the ocean spirit's power when it helped on, and also how the moon spirit could do avatar-level waterbending. Still, those thoughts passed Sokka over within a split second, as he knew that the form these spirits inhabited right now was harmless. They wouldn't be able to harm a child, much less him. Sorry about what I said at the party. 
Sokka started with an apology when you turned around to look at him with tears in her eyes. Looking at her face almost made his heart feel a little heavy at what he was doing here. But he knew that it was something he had to finish, and not let it halfway done. I said the first thing that came to mind when I saw you slip. At least this way it would make me seem more like a fool than you. He had also done that to lower everyone's expectations, and get some alone time with you so he could fill her mind with strange ideas. But of course, he wasn't going to tell her that. Sometimes when an opportunity meets preparation, you have to make a move, and that was what Soka did. Plus beforehand he had acted as if he was drinking a lot, so this incident wouldn't affect him that much, or at all. But you didn't know any of that. While to her it was an accident, to Sokka it was a carefully calculated plan. As a princess, you have way more to lose by such an accident than I do. You looked down, her face unseen by Sokka as he got closer and stared at the pond. It felt like the spirits swimming down there were looking at him. Spirits always creep me out. Their abilities are sometimes very complicated, and they always seem to know more than they should. He sat down in front of the pond as if daring them to do something. Sokka knew that every spirit seemed to have some kind of intelligence. Inviting you to sit down with him, he pointed at the fish and said, What are they? It feels like these fish are looking at me weirdly. You sat down and leaned her head on his shoulder as a small smile adorned her face. They are two in La, the moon and ocean spirits. Then she started explaining her life story, and how she was given life through the spirits. While at the same time, Sokka zoned her out while still keeping his ears open for any kind of new information that she might reveal. Katara was also at the entrance of the Pong Cave with a smile on her face. Glad that her brother wasn't feeling too down by the event. Stupid people, always making things seem like a bigger deal than they are. Though she couldn't get the image of Sokka's change off her mind, Katara wondered if she might have seen something. Their eyes might have been fooled by the Dark Knight. Or maybe this is one of Sokka's tricks. He may have known I was there, following him. At the same time, a large Fire Nation fleet was sailing towards the Northern Water Tribe. Hundreds of ships, fully manned with soldiers and armored to take down any enemy in the world. But the biggest ship amongst them was the one leading the whole operation. The golden encrustations on it showed that it was a royal ship. And at its deck stood Azala, the head of this operation with her two friends standing by her side. Tai Lee, who usually wore skimpy clutching with her belly exposed, was wearing more clothes. As the weather kept getting colder the closer they got to the North Pole. Mai kept to her usual baggy clothes. What's on your mind, Azala? Asked Mai, wondering if her best friend might be nervous about the expedition. Failure wasn't an option as she would be severely punished if that happened. This was half of the Fire Nation's fleet, and if they lost it well, there would be trouble, to say the least. Just wondering whether the Northern Water Tribe will end up being handed in a platter by the time we get there, she smiled, and that was when Mai understood. Azala was confident in her victory, and had already finished preparing everything. War was a complicated thing, and Azala planned to use every dirty trick she could to win this with the least losses possible. Mai continued looking at her friend curiously, trying to figure out what she was thinking. Under such a situation, the princess should be feeling the pressure, but she wasn't. Why was she so confident? The next day came about, Arn and Katara were excited to meet their new waterbending teacher. They immediately got ready, and went in front of the palace, waiting for Master Paku. Sokka followed them and stood by in a lanky posture and yawned. When is the white moustache guy coming? Katara was about to elbow her brother, but she stopped as Paku slowly came into view with his usual strict look. Sokka saw this and just waved at everyone. Well, see you later guys. I gotta go and see what the warrior divisions are up to. Going to the barracks, Sokka was met with warriors training their spearmanship, and some were sparring. He yawned, there wasn't anything that could be learned here. With just one look he could tell the mistakes they were making, and he wasn't in a mood to correct them. While most in his position would mistake these people as his allies, they were far from that. The Northern Water Tribe would be the opposite of an ally after this war was over, especially once the oil reserves will be found in the future. They will use this ruling claim, about how the chieftain of the Northern Water Tribe also rules the South. It was human greed, Sokka understood that. He also had his greed, and there was no way in hell he was going to train an army that in the future, could become his enemy. Hey, what are you doing here? Someone called out to him rudely. He nonchalantly turned around and saw Han staring at him with an angry flame in his gaze. But Sokka wasn't here to fight with some snot-nosed brat, whose betrothed wanted to be with someone else. So he ignored Han and walked towards the teacher, spear in hand and ready. Excuse me, he called out politely, with a harmless smile. I am Sokka. The new guy with the avatar. Can I train here? The man looked at him. He had a strict face as his eyes glared back at Sokka with an intense gaze. Oh. He suddenly exclaimed, a smile slowly adorning his face. You're the too heavy guy from yesterday. But ha ha. Don't worry kid. Every one of us old folk has had their own mistakes when we were young. It isn't the end of the world. While the man tried to console him, Sokka kept a polite smile on his face. But he wasn't that worried about the incident either. Things like these always get brushed over. Still, as he listened to the advice of the teacher, his gaze was glued on Han as he talked to his friends and seemed to scheme something. Just then, dark snow started falling from the sky, surprising everyone as they looked at the sky fearfully, signaling that something sinister was getting closer. This was a situation Sokka had predicted, 
though the upcoming Fire Nation attack might end up happening sooner than the original timeline. Azula would be a harder opponent, but Sokka welcomed that with open arms. As the people around him were scared and confused, he played along by having a worried gaze as he stared at the dark snow. By now Katara hadn't even gotten around to convincing Master Paku to teach her. Sokka sighed. It seemed like he would have to take the steering wheel on this one. Because if he let things play along, Azula would take over without much trouble. They would have to escape with Katara learning nothing. He couldn't allow that, because then the Fire Nation would become too dangerous to handle. What Sokka is playing here was a very dangerous game, like juggling many sharp objects, one mistake, and his hand would end up being cut off. But he had two, this way he could at least somewhat control the outcome of events. Hey, Han called him over, and by the smirk on his face, it was easy to see that he was up to something. How about a friendly spa? Han. Sokka stared at Han for a couple of seconds, and a new idea started forming in his head. What he needed right now was control over the outcome, and to get that, he would have to get in close contact with the military of the Northern Water Tribe. Essentially he needed to befriend people in high places. He casually walked towards Han, who had a bone spear in his hand. What do you want? Sokka was unbothered as he casually walked towards him. You wanted a spa, right? Well, I will give you one. Fwish. Within an instant, Sokka displayed almost supernatural speed. His spear blitz becoming unseen to the natural eye and cutting Han's bone spear into a over pieces. Han looked at his weapon in shock, but there wasn't anything that he could do as Sokka's spear was pointed at his throat. No matter what trick, scheme, plan, or whatever you pull, it becomes completely useless against absolute power. Fwish. Sokka whooped his spear. Han flinched, thinking he had been cut. But no, as the wind around him picked up, changing the course of the dark snow around Sokka. So not even one of them touched his body. Han fell on his behind, his eyes widened in shock, as he had never seen anything like this. No matter how hard he trained, the distance between him and Sokka was already something that couldn't be closed. The other warriors from the sidelines caught sight of this. But Sokka didn't pay any attention to them, knowing that he had to move things along faster now. Azula's attack would be dangerous. Not something like Zhao, who just had his ships charge and fight even during a full moon. He was what people would call a very incompetent leader. It confused even Sokka just how could such an incompetent man rise through the Fire Nation's ranks. Maybe he is just good at listening to orders. Even the high ranks needed someone incompetent, but who would listen to the Fire Lord's orders, with no questions asked, and carry them out no matter what. As he walked off, Sokka had a determined look in his eyes. He didn't have the luxury to play around as a harmless and innocent young man anymore. From now on, he had to change or more correctly, he had to start showing qualities that were needed in a war. A soft, naive, young man would be cannon fodder at best. Sokka wouldn't allow that to happen to him. Katara was annoyed that she had learned to heal. While it was a useful ability to have, she needed more. Women here weren't allowed to fight. It annoyed her to no end. But she knew that fighting against it was useless. Normally, she would have asked Han to teach her what Paku does during the day. But Katara no longer was so naive, because she knew that Paku was a prideful guy, and might stop teaching Han altogether if she did something like that. Instead, Katara is now waiting until they get out of here, and Han learns what he needs to. Only after finishing all his training, she will learn waterbending from him. Even if Paku learned about it then, it would no longer matter. There was nothing he could do about it. She angrily dragged her feet to go and meet up with Arn and her brother. Suddenly, an arm was wrung around her neck, almost in a chokehold. Katara was ready to skewer her attacker with ice spikes, but looked at his arm and knew who it belonged to. Sokka, I am not in the mood for games right now. What? My cute little sister rejected her brother's attempts to cheer her up. Sokka nudged her playfully, but that atmosphere didn't stay around for long as his face turned cold. I think we should fix this problem soon. Having my cute sister so worried makes me feel angry. Katara recognized the look on his face as a chill crawled down her spine. So it wasn't a hallucination yesterday. Who would have thought that my brother had a side like this? Dear sister, Sokka addressed her. He wasn't trying to hide anything from her. Life sometimes is quite harsh. So you have to be a lion. I will get Paki to teach you waterbending today. There is no need to rush dash no, there is. You know what the duck snow means. The Fire Nation is close by. Sokka clarified, reminding his sister that the Northern Water Tribe wasn't some safe sanctuary any longer. I don't think you understand how I feel about this sister. If you die because of some stupid tradition that didn't allow you to learn waterbending the Fire Nation won't be the only one I will blame. Katara looked uncomfortable at this, she squirmed. But Sokka's hold on her shoulders got stronger as he whispered in her ear. If you die, I will kill Paku and do everything in my power to slaughter everyone in the Northern Water Tribe for having such a tradition. Stop, Katara elbowed him harshly though he didn't have any reaction, and kept looking his sister in the eye. Stop talking about such things. Ash Katara POV dash. Don't tell such jokes, they aren't funny. It felt like my heart would burst out of my chest. I could immediately tell that he wasn't joking. When Sokka said he would kill everyone if something happened to me, he was serious. But I didn't want to hear it. I don't want to see this version of you, Sokka. You are my sometimes naive, but strangely smart brother, who girls seem to flock around. This cold side of you, 
I don't want to think of it as anything more than an act. Even though I knew it wasn't an act. Maybe this cold side was the true him all along. No, I can't keep thinking like that. I didn't want to feel such a cold terror from my brother. I didn't want to be scared of him. They were jokes, right? Saying this was just an opportunity for him to continue our delusion. I knew that he probably planned to make me aware of this cold side of his. But please, brother, don't act like such a different person. Do I even know you anymore? Suddenly, Sokka's cold look turned into a smile. And he chuckled. Of course, I'm joking. But if something were to happen to you, I would be pretty mad. You know how older brothers are. If anyone is gonna bully you, it's gotta be me. Because someone else doing it pisses me off. That cold feeling disappeared as if it was never there to begin with. But this time, I knew for sure that Sokka seemed to have a darker side to him. Something that he had kept hidden for years. By the way, you sound like you have some grandiose plan to have me learn waterbending. Katara changed the subject. I do, Sokka nodded, which going by his words would be reassuring. But the evil laugh and comically villainous chuckle that came after that wasn't reassuring at all. Sai, what a troublesome brother. He just became a hundred times more difficult to handle. The difficult part was telling which Sokka was the real him and which was an act. Sokka knew that sooner or later, this side of him would eventually be revealed to his sister. So it was better to show such a thing in a controlled environment, or else it would create needless drama in their lives. Since this was a time of war, Sokka understood that killing people would eventually become inevitable. He would rather have Katara get used to him now, than later. Having her brother suddenly start killing people without remorse would come as a shock. It might even create a sense of bewilderment. If he had this side of him, did she even know her brother? They were family, so Sokka was sure she would accept him. But he still knew that there was a possibility Katara could have acted differently or distance herself. Did you tell anyone here what the duck snow means? He inquired curiously because if no one knew, he wasn't planning to tell them. Yes, Katara nodded. I told my teacher, and she probably spread the news, even Chieftain probably knows by now. Sokka wanted the Fire Nation attack to come as more of a surprise, since it would create panic amongst everyone. But this plan was a faulty one to begin with, so it would have been better if Katara hadn't said anything. He knew that he had to play with people's feelings a little. What was the best and fastest way to get yourself in a high position of political power? First and foremost, there must be an enemy. If there isn't, make up one. Second, incite panic against that real or fake enemy. Make them a hundred times worse. That was a strategy that Sokka was confident would be successful even in times of peace. But since the world was at war, he also needed to show another quality. Power, both in mind and body. Someone you wanted on your side during the war. Wanna know how I will have Paka teach you waterbending? Sokka asked with an amused look on his face. He felt a little bad for manipulating Katara like this. But it was better than having her die. Katara raised a questioning brow. But she was curious. Her brother could always come up with some crazy plans. So if she said that she wasn't a little intrigued and excited to hear it, it would be a lie. The plan is violence. Sokka stated while smiling as if he was talking about the weather. Violence. That doesn't sound like a good idea. They were in the middle of the Northern Water Tribe, where the strongest waterbenders in the world stood. The place was surrounded by ice and water, and they were outnumbered. You are my brother, and I love you, Sokka. But that's the stupidest thing you have ever said, and that means a lot more than you think. He ignored the insults, and like a wise teacher, he pointed at the sky smugly. If violence isn't enough, then you just haven't used enough of it. In this case, violence isn't the answer. No, violence isn't the answer. I agree on that, he nodded. Violence is a question, and the answer is yes. In the end, Katara expected some kind of answer to his plans. But she forgot that Sokka was someone whose 99% of his daily enjoyment came from annoying her. The smirk on his face as he intently looked at her was a clear indicator of his mood. Sokka was extremely amused. In front of the palace, Arn was practicing waterbending with Paku. The elderly man stared at the avatar intently and pointed out any small mistakes that he made. As expected from the avatar, his mistakes are minuscule, and he doesn't make the same mistake twice. He is learning quite quickly too. As the water moved above him like a giant serpent, Paki kept staring at it with a nonchalant expression, making sure to not show anything on his face. The people were also observing the avid waterbending. This put them at ease as news of the Fire Nation attacking had spread out too. Heyo, oh, excuse me. Are you the teacher who refused to teach my poor sister? Sokka's voice rang through as he walked to the waterbending training field, as if he owned the place with hands in his pockets. Paku, right? Are you here to fight for your sister? Paku said someone at his age knew the recklessness of youth and what it made people do. The Northern Water Tribe has their traditions, and it's been so since the beginning. We aren't going to change our traditions and way of life for an outsider. Sokka didn't answer him at first and shrugged. Jeez, old man, you like making assumptions. He grumbled his long-drawn words annoying the waterbending master. Who knows what I'm fighting for, life sometimes can be a confusing riddle. If you don't know what someone's goal is, then you won't know what they will do either. Also, who even said I was here to fight you? For a youngster, you know how to hide your emotions quite well. 
Paku praised him with a small smirk. But your aura screams of rage and anger. You feel more like a mad beast than man. Ha 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 come on now. Don't joke around like that. Sokka dismissed Paku's words with a casual hand wave. We will just have a small spa and bet. If you win, I will do whatever you want for a whole year. If I win, you will teach Katara waterbending. Paku snorted. I see no reason in fighting you. So what if I had you following me around for a whole year? It would be useless. Unlike the others among the spectators, who were a little annoyed at Sokka's antics and how disrespectful he was to Paku. But the latter, the old man, could see through the provocation and wouldn't take Sokka's bait so easily. Then how about I give you something very important that you will like? Sokka kept a smile on his face throughout the deal. But in his mind, this bitchy old man. You think I cannot see that you're trying to get a better deal out of this? Unlike most others, Sokka knew how old men like Paku worked. They were very shrewd and would rip you off a hand and a leg. While old people could be sweet and nice, the ones that had dealt with politics usually were very demanding. Always looking to earn something out of a deal. Comparing Paku to such old men might be a little of a stretch as he didn't intend to harm them. But it wasn't necessarily wrong either as a master waterbender like him had to learn how to deal with politics. Why do things have to always be so complicated? Sokka's mind worked at top speeds trying to see if there was any hole in his plans. The old master sighed and in the end accepted Sokka's wager. Okay, okay, you stupid brat, I will take care of you. Ha ha ha, you're right. I am quite stupid. But be careful of stupid people old man. They are reckless and don't think of the consequences. On a Fire Nation ship, Azula had a spyglass and was able to catch sight of the Northern Water Tribe's walls. An excited smile adorned her lips as she chuckled. Hello little kitty seems like I caught something interesting. Wow, that's an evil smile. Tai Lee whispered to Mai, who only nodded and walked away not wanting to get into the way of Azula's wrath. Tai Lee has been speaking a lot lately. Maybe it was Kuzan's influence. But Azula didn't seem to mind the jokes sometimes. But it was always 50 50 and no one else, other than Akala's Tai Lee, would do anything with such odds. That was like betting your life on a coin flip. When will we start the attack? Mai asked, wanting to know when the battle would start. Attack. Immediately, of course, Azula's smile widened. We can't let the enemy prepare. But it will be a full moon soon. Trust me, even if there were two moons in the sky, it won't help them with what's going to happen. A sacrifice a day keeps the Grim Reaper away. Paku stood opposite of me, and by his stance, I could tell that while he had a nonchalant look on his face, the old man was on guard, with a normal spear in my hand. I wondered how I should beat him. The water around him moved like a serpent as he shot it at me. Katara looked on anxiously, worried about her well-being. Don't look so down, little sister. Your brother isn't that weak even against a waterbender in his habitat. Charging at Paku. I felt the ground under me shift as it turned into water. I was barely able to jump away and not be submerged in water. Water circulated him as he shot out some ice projectiles. Waterbending had both good defensive and attacking. While the old man's mindset might be a little outdated, he was a master waterbender and showed that clearly. I felt the chilly feeling before the attack even came and had to jump up as the ground turned into icy spikes. If I openly used waterbending, then Paku wouldn't be too much of a challenge. While I was mid-air, instead of attacking, he turned the ice around him into water, with only a small slab of ice to stand on. You might be a good spearman, but you choose the wrong fight. No matter how good without footing, you can't even get close to me. If we were on land, I would have lost. But here the advantage I have is too overwhelming. You really like the sound of your voice, old man. Hearing my chuckles, his eyes narrowed in anger. As I was about to land on the ground, spears of ice came mercilessly. There were over a dozen of them. You know, he might be trying to kill me, or at least hurt me very badly. That wasn't smart of him because if he is willing to hurt me, then I will return the favor too. Clang, clang, clang. Using my spear, I broke all the ice but was pushed back by the attacks. Feeling the ground below me get softer again, as if to turn into water, I jumped to the side and immediately charged at him halting at the end of the pond, and using every ounce of my agility and strength to leap at him. He tried to attack, I did backflip mid-air, and changed my position slightly, just enough to dodge each ice attack. Packer's eyes widened as he saw me get close to him. He tried to move his hands, but it was too late as using the blunt side of my spear, I hit his throat and left him gasping. With the momentum of my leap, I tackled him, and we were both thrown outside of the water pond, getting up immediately after I pointed my spear at the old man. There when you were hit with the blunt part of my spear, I could have used the sharp side. Also, even in the beginning, you underestimated me. So if I threw my spear then, you would have been dead. While he had been on guard from the beginning, Paku had grossly underestimated me. I couldn't put all the blame on him, as by now my movements were bordering on the supernatural. I was stronger than my size suggested, and I was also faster than strength might suggest. My body has become something unnatural. Standing up, I looked every spectator in the eye and spread my arms in a welcoming manner. Anyone who wants to fight me, or disagrees with my opinion, come forward, this is your chance. Show me that your traditions are worth following, or maybe they are just something holding you back. 
outdated traditions have no place anywhere. You are losing valuable waterbenders just because you are stubborn. To me right now you are a foolish tribe as only fools would do something like this. Some of the people in the crowd frowned, and most of them were annoyed. The angry ones, clenching their weapons, and some waterbenders stepped forward. You're a tribe that is intentionally weakening themselves during a war. Do you want me to close my eyes and bow down saying that you are strong when you aren't? Traditions that created a sense of belonging to the tribe were good. But ones like not allowing female waterbenders to learn how to fight were downright stupid. So useless traditions like that need to get lost in the annals of time. Well, while I used the tradition as a way to invite their anger, I didn't care about it much. If the women wanted changes, they could revolt themselves. Becoming the world's white knight police wasn't on my agenda. A person would have to be conceited as hell, or just stupid to think that their opinions on things were always right. But I needed an excuse, and this tradition was an excuse as good as any. This way it would make people angry and they would attack me. Why would I want that? Obviously to beat the hell out of them. In times of peace beating them up might be considered violent and unnecessary. One by one, they came and tried to fight me. But after Paku, I was easily able to incapacitate the others. But I made sure to not hurt them too badly. The more meat shields were between me and Azala, the better it was. She was dangerous. As dinner came around, Katara was sitting next to me while An was dining with the chieftain. You hurt my teacher so bad he can't teach me today. She pouted, looking at me with a pointed gaze. She needed to learn how to act angry better. Her worry was showing in her eyes and brow. Don't crunch your fingers, or pick at your food. If you want to act angry, do it well enough to at least trick me. Ah, there are people way better than me at reading people out there that will be able to see your intentions. So at least learn enough to trick me. At least well enough that I would need to use the interface to tell if she was lying or not. To thrive in any human civilization, you need to be a good liar. The greatest of kings of conquerors were amazing liars. The best of their generation. Of course, history will never say and put them on a pedestal of glory. Looking at you. I noticed that she was looking at me, and as soon as our gazes met, she looked to the side, embarrassed. Giving her what she wanted would be dangerous. I will have to keep myself accessible, just outside of her grasp. As soon as I give her what she wants, she will realize that the crush on me was something temporary. Boom, suddenly an explosion rang out, and the palace seemed to shake. What the fuck just happened? Azala. Boom, another explosion rang, this one louder, and seemed about to crumble down the palace. What the hell were the guards doing? Danger sense has sensed extreme danger in all directions. Fuck. I grabbed Katara in a princess carry and immediately jumped off the window. The others could die for all I cared. It's their fault for having such incompetent guards. Clack. As we land on the ground, the ice below me cracks like a spiderweb with me in the middle. Looking around, there were no attacks or soldiers. Where the hell are the attacks coming from? Looking up, I saw the full moon and frowned. Was Azala dumb enough to attack during the full moon? No, there was no sign of attack, and everyone was confused and panicked too. The people had woken up and were running around panicked. There were no signs of where an attack might have come from, even though some houses had crumbled down. Azala, that smart bitch. Where the hell is the attack coming from? Boom, suddenly ice under my feet split apart opening a huge ravine in the ice. The palace crumbled down as its foundation became unstable. The attack was coming from under the ice. Looking at the deep ravine in the ice, I couldn't help but think, how many explosions did she use down there? Also, the logistics of getting the explosions down from underwater was bound to be a pain. Fuck. Maybe I shouldn't have killed Zhao. Handling him would have been way easier. Azala is such a pain. Still, this exposed another weakness, but not on a side. Also, now that I thought about it, this could be turned around and become an advantage. Looking around, the situation was kind of perfect. People were panicking. The leadership had died probably. I could take over this place. But as thoughts of ambition started blooming in my heart, they died down as soon as they came. Because while checking if Arn was alive by using the map function, I saw something that broke my heart. The chieftain, Arnok, was alive with some waterbenders surrounding him and you. Arn was too. But a ton of important officials were taken out with one hit. This attack was planned by Azala carefully, and she even calculated the distance, and where her people should put the explosives. What an ingenious plan. She probably predicted that as soon as her ships became visible to the people here, the generals would gather toward the big tower that said hey, important people live here. It was like a huge target for her, and while she wasn't able to take out many people, her objective was to kill off the generals, and as many high-ranking people as possible. All along, it wasn't her goal to kill the leader, but to cripple military command. That I think I might have underestimated her intelligence. Even though I already assumed so much of her. No, it wasn't underestimating. She simply grew smarter and wiser with me around her for support. She no longer saw the world that her father painted. No, she would draw what she wanted herself. Now even as I was in danger, I wouldn't be surprised if Azala ended up killing her father and taking his place. Ah, dear Azala, you're growing so well. 
Due to precisely figuring out a budding great general's plan in such a short time, intelligence increased by one for predicting about Azala's goal to target the higher ranking leaders. Your wisdom increases by one year of a young girl's mind was nothing short of phenomenal. Intelligence increased by one oi, oi, oi. You're making me seem like some kind of bad guy here who is manipulating Azala to get what I want which wasn't necessarily untrue. But come on, don't word it so harshly, you shitty interface. It's all for the greater good damn. I was starting to sound like Dumbledore. Maybe I'm a little scheming. Of course, the interface didn't answer to me calling in bad names. It didn't have AI intelligence after all. I was tempted to kill off the chieftain. That way it would make taking over this place very easy. But doing that would bring a whole array of other problems. Katara would see me kill him. No matter how I tried to disguise it, she would figure it out. Also, Arn was here and some spirits were probably spying on me. After I killed the evil lady, nothing was stopping them from looking. Some annoying spirits were probably spying on me already. I couldn't wait till the time came for me to kill them. To go on a spirit killing spree there were two things I needed. One was a teleportation ability that I could use indefinitely, and second, a way to sense them. Even map wasn't that much of a help when I wanted to find them. Some spirits could even hide from the map completely. Having those two skills, I could level grind, and within days I would be able to farm hundreds of levels. Putting Katara down, I stared at the deep ravine which I couldn't see the end of. My cute sister said something, but I was zoning her out as every thought in my mind was concerned with only one thing. What was Azla's next move? If I was in her place, what would I do? Fuck. If I was in her place, some twisted shit came to mind. But she didn't grow up with the internet to give her twisted ideas. Tonight was a full moon, so it was very unlikely she would attack. As a perfectionist, Azla wouldn't want to win a battle with heavy losses. The Fire Nation couldn't afford one either. Katara, be careful, after saying that, I jumped down the hole. Fwish. The cold feeling of ice around me permeated my skin as I took off my jacket. I needed to figure out if the Fire Nation had discovered any kind of submarine technology because that would ruin things big time if I didn't know about it. The closer I got towards the end, the darker it became around me, but my eyes were already adjusted to the darkness, and with using the map, I doubted anyone could have better visibility than me down here. With a swing of my hand, the ice around me turned into water and grabbed into my arms, and I turned the top of the water into side-like hooks and dug into the icy wall, slowing down my fall. As I got closer to the water below, I noticed that there were a couple of red dots down below me. Landing into the water, there was a motorboat and a couple of people standing on it with a barrel in their boats. Probably explosive jelly. Did you hear something? Asked one of the Fire Nation soldiers as he looked around. Probably some fish. But let's finish this job and get some money. We will be set for three generations if we do this good enough. While Princess Azala might be dangerous as a member of the royal family, she had to hold her promises. Hey there, suddenly a new voice came into the mix and they looked on in surprise. But before they could do anything, they were knocked out. Sokka picked their bodies and gently put down the exploding jelly. Looking at the barrel, he wondered if he should let it explode. This way it might shake things and kill even Chief Arnok. In the end, he decided against it and just put the exploding jelly in his inventory. Using water bending, he raised the unconscious men and himself quite high. But after that, he used ropes to tie them up to him and started climbing by using two knives. This is some good strength training. He muttered a little excited as he could feel his muscles twitch in pain. At the top of the ravine, Katara waited anxiously for her brother to come up. But not much later she got a grasp on the situation and endured waterbending to lift away some of the debris from the ruined castle. Soon, many waterbenders calmed down and came to help her. None of them said anything about a female using waterbending. Even if they wanted to, Sokka had beaten the best waterbenders here to a pulp. None of them wanted to test their fate and see what he would do when he became angry. Fwish. Suddenly from the ravine, a long shadow jumped out and the warriors looked at him cautiously with spears in their hands and pointing them at him. Who goes there? Relax, Sokka reassured them as his figure became visible and he had two Fire Nation soldiers tied with him. I got the perpetrators, wanted to kill them, but decided to keep them alive so we can learn more about the enemy. The soldiers looked at him surprised. They couldn't even see the end of the ravine. And yet he went deep there and climbed up with nothing but physical strength and some knives. Also, he had already taken care of the danger, while the rest of their leaders were like trapped chickens. Also execute the people who came here impersonating the Avatar, Sokka said. No, he ordered them. And even though he didn't have any authority over them, everyone strayed in their backs. Those bastards were only playing at being the Avatar in case they were captured. In reality, they were looking for secret entrances. Isn't it curious how they found out a way to get so deep into an underground river? Be vigilant, we are at war. This isn't a place for mercy, or else this will happen again. Though Sokka's words sounded like advice, he intended to have people think why this hadn't been taken care of sooner. Being a leader was good, and one enjoyed luxury but a leader also will be blamed for anything bad, even if it wasn't their fault. I will call the healers here and organize them, since I am quite fast, and take care of the chieftain and others. Tonight the Fire Nation won't attack due to the full moon, he pointed up. With that, everyone looked up at the full moon, but as they looked back down, Sokka was no longer there, and only the two tied-up Fire Nation soldiers were left. 
It didn't take Sokka long to arrive at the healing huts, which also served as the place where the female waterbenders learned how to heal. The people there were all panicked, and an old woman was trying to calm them down. Sokka walked right up and with a spear in hand looked at them all. Hey, he called out to them harshly. He needed to shock them back to reality. People in the tribe are injured, go and help them. Also, send the best healers towards the tower. As soon as he said that, the people's bodies moved on their own, even though they were panicked, scared, and in shock. He had said what a good leader would have, but Sokka's intention all along was to empty this place. Because as soon as everyone was gone, he went to the back of the room and picked a book. Would you like to learn waterbending healing Y slash and he pressed Jess. After making sure no one was around and Smarvis manipulated a small amount of water towards his hand and it lightly shone. Healing level 1 an ancient waterbending technique. The higher the level the more it can heal. Heals 10 health points for 10 mana points. The higher the level, the better it can heal and the mana points cost lessons. He smiled, this was a skill he had been searching for a long time and this place was always filled with people and knew that normally it would have been hard to get his hands on one of these books. Maybe this attack was not so bad for me. It had been quite fruitful. But, I will still attack you Azela, so be careful. I can't go easy on you. Hopefully, you survive this. After learning that healing skill, I quickly went back to where I was needed, and helped with the crash side of the tower, and grabbed big degrees of ice and rock throwing them away easily. Though by using the map, I didn't go to save the chieftain, Arnok, but his daughter you. She didn't seem to have anyone close to her, so she was either pushed under the table for safety or got there herself. Pulling up one of the icy stones just above her, I saw that you was trembling in fear under a table that had been able to hold up quite well. There, there, I comforted her. She looked at me, eyes streaming down her face, and she had an ugly expression on her face. But I just pulled her up and enveloped her into a hug. It's okay now, everything is okay. I will take care of this. Sokka my father, the others. What happened to them? She cried on my shoulder, her tears making my shirt wet. I patted her back, feeling her shaking body. This probably was a very traumatic experience. Something that will stick for the rest of her life. PTSD usually happened due to a situation happening that was outside your power, experience, and something that you never contemplated. It has to be something so outside of expectation that will make her paranoid and feel powerless. Trauma that's normal. Well, no trauma was normal, and overcoming it is even harder than most things in the world. I would know a thing or two about it. An outsider could never understand. You, don't worry. I will protect you. You don't have to worry about anything. Knowing that the words coming out of my mouth were lies, I continued telling them. In reality, I had forgotten about her when the explosion happened. I just took myself and Katara out. Others were relatively unimportant. I could play the victim here and tell you that I was sorry for being unable to save her. Next time I will help her no matter what. But this was too early, as you just had images of being powerless in her mind, and saying that I was unable to save her wasn't something she wanted to hear. As her wailing continued, I was unsure if she even heard me. But still, I kept on comforting her, seeing that she was probably in shock and denial, one of the first stages of grief. She probably won't remember my words, but the comforting embrace was something else. Poor girl, she didn't even know her father was alive. But I won't tell her, because that would expose my map ability. Normally I would have said it anyway, and people would assume that I used it as a way to comfort her. If anyone asked, I would use the same excuse too. But there was one thing that stopped me from saying it well, a couple of things. First and foremost, it was that I didn't want to come out as a liar to you, who would tell her anything to make her feel better. It works short term, but not for long. Also, it will make her value my words less. Then there was the main reason, spirits, those bastards were observing, and I don't know if they can tell when I am lying or not. Some probably do, and I wasn't willing to test if any of them was smart enough to figure out I could sense living presences. Though Map didn't exactly do that, it was something similar. I wonder what Azela is thinking right now, probably laughing maniacally while celebrating her victory. At the same time, on Azela's ship, she was still observing the situation from afar, and had a frown on her face, as she saw the giant tower-like palace that had been Arnik to the Northern Water Tribe fall. Damn it, she cursed, annoyed at the outcome. Mai was by her side and didn't ask her anything even though Tai Lee was less reserved. You seem angry. Didn't everything play out as you wanted? Having a friend like her is useful. She always seems to ask the questions I am unwilling to ask. Thought Mai, with almost a smoke making its way onto her face. No Azala hiss, blue fire coming from the corners of her mouth. There was supposed to be another explosion, but it didn't happen. They have someone amazing on their side that took care of the problem fast, while others were panicking. Maybe it was a coincidence, Tai Lee once again said out loud what Mai was thinking. An accident could have happened. No, the Fire Princess refused immediately, her eyes staring glued towards the wall where the Water Tribe's most monumental building used to stand. Thinking like that is dangerous. Someone who could stop this would be a danger to anyone. Kuzan, he is there, that is very dangerous for him. 
No, he is smart enough to not fall for traps, so maybe this was why he has not been sending any information or letters. I should have thought of this sooner. Azala was on guard, but in the end could do nothing as she knew that charging now would lead to devastating losses. Especially since the avatar was there too. She was quite confident in her win due to the size of her navy, but didn't want to sacrifice too many ships and troops just to get a frozen land full of rebellious people that they would have to leave troops here to control. In her mind, attacking the Northern Water Tribe wasn't the best idea as they were already isolated and weren't in the fight. If she was in charge, the Azala would have first dealt with one problem at a time. After taking over the Earth Kingdom, only then she would delve into and easily take over the North Pole. I am sure father has a well thought out plan that I haven't been able to figure out yet. She tried to reassure herself that her father wasn't incompetent enough to do something like this, just for the sake of glory, or just to take it over for the fun of it. But certain thoughts passed through her mind like a poisonous snake. But she shook her head to get those kinds of things off her head. Start shooting catapults in every three to six hours intervals. Let's keep them scared and awake all night. We will be fully rested while they will freak out by just a couple framing catapults. She smiled, putting the spyglass down and walking back with Ty Lee and Mai following behind her. Azala looked up while walking and saw the full moon shining brightly in the sky. Soon in one week it will be a new moon. When waterbenders are at their weakest during the night, hours pass by and Sokka, with some of the surviving elders, military leaders, and chieftain Arnok had gathered to a small, undisclosed meeting room. Unlike the usual festive mood, they all had grave looks on their faces. Sokka leaned back, gazing at everyone in the room that was sitting at the small table. No one said anything initially, so he was the first one to mutter, if we are just going to stay here and stare absentmindedly into space, then we are in the wrong place, gentlemen. Though his tone was polite, everyone could tell that it was an insult. That made some people frown, but that didn't affect Sokka at all, and he just looked the frowning people in the eyes as if daring them to challenge him. He was an outsider and had no place in this meeting, but he was the one that had done the most during the incident and event took care of it. Not having him here would leave many people questioning questioning the leadership's competence. Still, that didn't mean the elders liked an inexperienced young man like him here. Arnok saw this and decided to not let any bad blood develop between anyone here. Then, let's start the discussion about the war plans on how to take care of the Fire Nation's attack. Sokka could feel the what he would jokingly call in his first life, the courting death. It revered through energy through the room. These old, one foot in the grave, elderly men were peering at him, as if it was an honor to even me to stand here with them. You incompetent fucks. You haven't had a war in at least a hundred years. There is no one here who even knows anything about war. You're isolated as hell and have no idea how the enemy acts. So don't stand here as if you are some experienced old man when you know nothing about war. Sokka's thoughts on the matter were clear, but he still kept a rational gaze, and made sure to not show any hostility outwardly. He didn't want the people here knowing just how low he thought of them. Chieftain, we need to wait and see how things play out. We can't just go out there and counterattack, suggested one of the elders. Yes, I agree with this, added another elder in support. Fighting against them head-on would be too reckless. Most of the elders agreed, though there were the ones like Paku, who seemed to be against such a move. The military leaders ended up silently agreeing on waiting to see what would happen. That's a genius ploy. They won't do another attack like this. Since we have taken care of the first initial problem, claimed one of the military elders with a long beard. When he heard that, Sokka turned towards the aforementioned elder and frowned. What did he mean by we? I was the one who took care of it. Are you sure you want to play with me like this old man? Read the room, old bastard Sokka glanced back towards the table, which had a map of the North Pole and the seas around it. Some red pie show game pieces were put down to show where the Fire Nation was. During the initial attack, many of the leadership personnel had died, and Sokka couldn't help but wonder if any competent military officer who at least somewhat knew basic war tactics was still alive. He clenched his teeth but held in the annoyance that had started bubbling inside of him. Chieftain Arnok was waiting for anyone to give any ideas or say something, and Sokka saw this as a chance, standing up and looking each elder in the eye. Wait, so that's your grand plan? Some of the elders stared at him with narrowed eyes, clearly showing contempt for a youngster to dare speak to them like this, with no respect in his voice. Sit down, you don't belong here. The elders are talking. As Elder Song said, sit down, outsider. We won't take advice from someone like you. What could someone your age even offer? Then how long are we going to wait? Until the full moon is gone. That's what the enemy wants? Sokka took a breath and didn't let anyone else talk as he continued. Are you too scared to act? Did fighting against a competent enemy scare you? Cowards. All of you are cowards. Why bother to hide your contempt for incompetence? Also, it wasn't like backing down here would offer any benefits. Instead, they would just pawn even more. The elders fumed in anger, their gazes were blazing with fury. But Sokka didn't stop and insulted everyone. His stare didn't waver either. There wasn't a trace of fear in his eyes. You don't understand how things work brat, you are young and think yourself to be invincible. But things aren't that simple, this time it was surprisingly Paku who spoke, and unlike the other elders here, he was one of the fearless ones. Paku, the young man is right, waiting here will do nothing for us, some of the elders, the minority, argued in Sokka's favor. 
They could see the logic in his words. I would like to apologize. Sokka's eyes settled on the waterbending master to anyone I have not yet offended. Please be patient. I will get to you shortly. His words made some of the elders get up. They were clearly about to do something. Though his words angered everyone here. What he said wasn't wrong, and it seemed to make the elders even angrier. The enemy was just waiting, but they were afraid to go against an unending sea of fire nation ships. Since as leaders, they would have to lead, and that meant death. Fighting against a scarily competent enemy is scary, especially when they outnumber you. Yet they are still cautious and give it their all against them. They were thinking at the moment while Sokka knew that Azula was most likely waiting for the new moon, and she would attack with her full might then. But by the atmosphere in the room, Sokka couldn't help but wonder if, by the time she attacked, the cowardly elders might hand it to her on a plate. That was when he came to a realization. These guys have had their spirits broken by the destruction of the tower. The enemy not only outnumbered, but outsmarted them too. They no longer want to fight against Azula. Instead, they are planning what to do after the invasion. Sokka peered at them, his eyes were like an X-ray. The elders felt like he could see straight through them. He sighed and sat back down on his seat with a tired look. The elders' spirits were crushed. There was no use in saying anything anymore. The initial attack on the main tower had had more adverse effects than he thought. This wasn't just a matter of the elders wanting to be safe for themselves, but they wanted to keep their family safe too. Almost all of them saw a reason to fight anymore. It would just be preventing the inevitable. The elders continued to argue, each bringing up their points. Some say that the Fire Nation wouldn't be able to hold a fleet and such a big army for long here, as it would be too costly. Normally that would have been a good reason as even Gen Generals are human and can make miscalculations. Sokka knew that as it had been done in his previous world countless times too. But this was Azala, not some incompetent commander. She knew what she was doing, and came here early for a reason. To put the fear of God in these people and have them surrender by themselves. Sokka didn't say anything about it, and continued listening for the rest of the meeting, not even uttering a word to anyone. But his stare seemed to unnerve a lot of people. He seemed angrier than anyone in here. My suggestion is that we attack them. A sneak attack during the full moon, with darkness as our cloak of invisibility. The attack doesn't have to be big, just enough to startle the enemy at least. The elders seemed to think, and they agreed. Though they didn't like soccer, and most of them made it pretty clear during the meeting, the old men could see this sneak attack as a way to regain honor. Sokka's influence was quite high, and if they didn't take any action during, the people who had seen his actions while the other ruling body was trapped under the tower. He was a hero, the dangerous kind of hero with a lot of influence, who wouldn't listen to what the higher-ups told him to do. I volunteer to be the one to go and lead the attack. Sokka raised his hand. He seemed to have calmed down, but everyone in the room assumed that he was still angry. This sneak attack mission was an easy one as an attack could mean a lot of things. Not necessarily the dangerous kind of attack. Sokka's offer to volunteer himself had opened a dam. And one by one, all of the elders raised their hands, offering themselves too, most planning to just make a small detour and come back. We agree too, though the plan will have to be changed. We can't leave such a thing to a young and inexperienced man like him. Yes, yes, sometimes the bravery of youth can get in the way. Though their words sounded like compliments, they were backhanded insults calling him a reckless brat. Sokka only closed his eyes for a second and opened them. They were emotionless, showing nothing of what he might be thinking. Everyone focused on the chieftain, waiting for his decision, as he was the one who had the final call. Arnok had a contemplative look on his face as he glanced at the old faces on the table. He had known these men for so long, and even grew up with some of them. But still, it made him wonder what would happen if he went against their wishes. Would they revolt? That was the last thing he needed in the middle of a war, to have a civil war. If he had his pick on who to lead the mission, it would be either Sokka or Paku. They were the most competent people. But if they went out there, these unsatisfied elders might decide to revolt. I Arnok paused, not knowing what to say. It felt like only wrong choices were presented to him, as no matter what he did, it would have a bad ending. This made the chieftain feel like he was about to throw up, and cold sweat prickled his skin as he tried to act calm. His daughter came to mind amidst all this. Since the incident you hadn't eaten anything or even gotten out of bed. Though she wasn't hurt physically, use mind on the other hand. This decision will be postponed until tomorrow. I will think about it tonight. Sokka was the first one to get up. He didn't bow politely, nor say anything. And he just stormed off. Anuk sighed, but didn't say anything to the young man. ECH, what a disrespectful brat. In the end, he didn't even say anything. What did you expect from a southern brat? As soon as Sokka had walked out of the meeting, some of the elders started talking bad about him behind his back. Arnok goes to his new residence, which used to be an empty house. He had lost his palace, and now had to live in such small quarters with only two bedrooms. But he didn't mind. His mind was heavy with the decision he will have to make tomorrow, and as he stared into the horizon, he saw the sun rising. A new day was already to come about, and the anxiety in his heart kept rising. And just like that, a new day comes about. It was a beautiful sunrise that brought him a sense of damnation. No soldiers have clashed, yet the Fire Nation destroying the Northern Water Tribe felt inevitable, discouraging the higher-ups. At least the people that weren't in high places had no idea what was happening, and they still hadn't had their hopes crushed yet. 
Arnok took a plate of food towards his daughter's room and knocked. You, breakfast is here. Come out and eat. She hadn't eaten anything since yesterday, and that worried him like any parent would feel concerned for their child starving. Surprisingly, you came out. Her eyes were bloodshot as if she had cried all night. Arnok didn't know what to say or do. Once again he was caught between a rock and a hard place. He could see that his daughter needed all of his attention. As a parent, it was his duty to be with her. You gazed at her father and smiled gently. Don't worry. I am not hurt or anything. Arnok's heart clenched once again his duties as a father and a leader clashed. But he could do nothing but smile. You, I will always love you. You're my daughter. If you ever need anything, tell me. You, like always, her kindness shone through as she smiled. I'm fine, father. I was just tired after the events of yesterday. Sokka also offered help, he is kind. Hearing Sokka's name made Arnok frown for a split second. But he came to his senses quickly, as he didn't want his daughter to see this side of him. Father, if you ever can, please help Sokka too. He is a kind guy, requested you, with a strange, but satisfied smile on her face. Arnok sighed, once again, his conflicting feelings just continued getting more complicated. What do I do? This situation I have no experience in dealing with it. After around 8 hours, as midday came about, many catapult shots were launched by the Fire Nation, shooting giant clumps of earth covered in flames. Just like before, Sokka, Anok, Paku, and the other elders were here. Amongst them, Sokka seemed the most relaxed. He even yawned, which annoyed quite some elders. But by now, their relationship was already bad, so Sokka no longer had a reason to bother being polite to them. Arnok wasn't the only one who had thought about some things last night, everyone here had their agenda. Each of them had a general plan of what they wanted from this meeting, and would end up satisfied if they didn't get it. Everyone awaited the chieftain's decision. Arnok could feel the gazes on him. I have decided on a plan. Sokka, you are a smart young man, and I am thankful for everything you have done. After this war is finished, you can ask me for one favor, and I will do my best to accommodate your request. Even though you're young, your intelligence knows no bounds. The elders started frowning. Seeing their leader complimenting Sokka so much made them suspicious of Arnok and what he was going to choose. I have thought it through a lot, and in the end, my decision is he paused and sighed. To follow Sokka's plan, it was nothing short of genius, and he was the one that came up with it. Sokka smiled, the elders were left grumbling, but Anuk wasn't done yet as he continued. Though Elder Song, Ming, and Tai will be in charge. Immediately, Sokka's smile turned into a frown and concluded. Anuk, you dumbass. Are you trying to please both sides? The real world doesn't work like that. Trying to please everyone will end up with everyone hating you. The elders that were sent to this mission were quite radical and the main opposition. Anuk thought that giving everyone a part of what they wanted would please both sides. That it had the opposite effect as Sokka frowned, holding his words in. While the mentioned elders felt like they were some subordinates made to follow Sokka's plan no matter what. In the end, everyone was unsatisfied. Arnok took notice of this, and he too wanted to get angry. He had a daughter at home that needed him most, but he instead had to deal with these three-sided parties. But in the end, he still failed. Sokka got up and walked out of the meeting room with an annoyed look on his face. As soon as he went outside, his angry gaze shifted as a small smile took place on his face, showing that all along, it was all just a ploy. Sokka didn't care about the Northern Water Tribe, as it was just an end to a means for him. On the sea close by, a pigeon flew through the sky and landed on Azala's ship. Like always the princess wasn't slacking, and instead personally kept an eye out on each event herself. She didn't want anything to go wrong. Two Lee and Mai were accompanying her, like always. The white pigeon landed on Azala's arm, with a small note tied to its leg. Well, look what we have here. It seems like he finally decided to send something. Why are you so sure that it's Kuzan? Tai Lee inquired. Her curious nature seemed to get the best of her most of the time. But Azala didn't mind answering, as she opened a small note and smirked, just as she had expected. It was from Kuzan. The small letter held a very detailed explanation of times, roots, and everything. Mai glanced at the paper and was confused. It seemed too complicated. What's this? A plan? The Fire Princess chuckled. Seems like Kuzan has figured out a plan on how the Northern Water Tribe wants to raid us at night, during the full moon. Ah, uh, you seem unworried, Tai Lee muttered awkwardly, seeing that her old friend didn't seem even a little nervous at the news of waterbending assassins being sent after her. While we were still at sea, the assassins would even have the advantage of the full moon too. Night came about, and another full moon stood up in the sky, like a miniature sun about to die out, as it shone soft light down on the sea. Outside of the royal ship, a crew of waterbenders slowly came out from underwater and started climbing the boat, using waterbending and helping the non-benders get on the deck as quietly as they could. You guys came later than expected, Azala's voice rang out in the ship, and the attackers looked up, some of the elders gazed up in fear. They hadn't planned to fight here, just hit a couple of guards and ran away. So at least they could use the excuse of things going wrong. If they saw a chance of winning the war, and their family's safety guaranteed, they might have tried helping the cause. But people were selfish, while they had a sense of a community, their nation tribe. But in the end, was it wrong to want your safety and that of your family? To others, the elders' actions might seem selfish. They knew that too. 
but they had important things they wanted to protect. The latest crumbing of the palace showed that the Northern Water Tribe and the Chieftain couldn't guide or protect their interests any longer. Elder Song, Ming, and Tai, the ones that had been at the forefront in demeaning Sokka's influence, looked each other in the eye and nodded. While their war experience might be lacking, Azula's gaze made it clear that none of them would be getting away tonight. So with that in mind, and the soldiers by their side, the elders resolved themselves. By getting rid of their leader, we can stop this. Maybe we can truly be the heroes in this. There were only around 15 guards around the young girl, and amongst them, there were another two young girls. So really, we would just have to fight just 13 people. While numbers weren't on our side, we have a chance. That single thought predominated through their minds, and with the full moon assisting them, they drew a large mass of water from the ocean. Decades of water bending together had made the old men be able to easily do coordinated bending. Even if as of lately they had gotten a little rusty due to age, maybe due to the dire situation, the elders noticed that they were bending better than they had ever done before in their lives. Sorry young lady, but we will have to get rid of you, said Elder Tai, his long beard fluttering in the wind as a mass of water shot towards Azula and the guards surrounding her. With the full moon on our side, a waterbender is unbeatable. Keep dreaming, old man. You're just a frog in the bottom of a well. After saying that, all are in one swift motion conjured lighting, and as it hit the wave of water head on, destroying it in an instant, and making the water splatter. The elders looked on in shock as another lightning bolt was shot at them again. But this time, though after a split second they noticed that the target of the lightning wasn't them, but the deck of the ship below their feet, boom an explosion was made as the lightning bolt hit the ground. Within an instant, all of the soldiers were taken out, and the ones left were all dazed. Due to the stealthy nature of the mission, the elders team consisted of only 10 people, all of which were taken out by Azali easily. Even though her enemy were down, and dazed, Azula didn't stop there as lightning crackled in his fingers again, and a malicious smile adorned her face. Die. By the end of the whole ordeal, only corpses were left of the attackers. Mai sneered as the smell of burned flesh permeated in the air, and this had been a reminder of something she had forgotten. Azula is crazy. Due to Kuzan's presence, it has slipped my mind, but undoubtedly, she is deranged, crazy, and ruthless. Azula will always be Azula. I have to keep that in mind. Or next, I might be the target of that deadly lighting. The fear that my thought had been forgotten, slowly crept into her heart again. Still, outwardly she acted as emotionless as always. Shouldn't we have at least kept one of them alive? Azula's gaze turned toward Mai, and her yellow eyes shone in the dark like those of a viper. So Mai quickly added, to extract information. No, Azula muttered, the terrifying smile on her face widening. We have Kuzan. They would have been dangerous since they could have escaped. She trusted him, after all, if his plan had taken her off guard it would have turned out quite dangerous. Ash Sokka POV I stood atop the icy walls of the tribe and looked at Azula's ship, and I couldn't make out what had exactly happened due to the long distance. But by using the map function, all of the men that were sent disappeared from it. This meant that Azula had killed them all. The elders were getting on the way, and while I could understand where they were coming from, that didn't mean I would spare them. If a nation I was living in couldn't protect me and my family, what was the use of following them? That was what probably went through their minds, and I would have done the same, but more delicately. After doing some stretches, I went back to training waterbending and my spearmanship. Time waited for no one, and not long from now, the full moon would be over. By then, I have to find a solution to this mess. How should I go about this? If Azula had been incompetent and needlessly prideful like the elders, she would have made my job easier. Even after having indirectly killed 10 people, Sokka acted coarsal and just trained with that he was able to increase his strength by two. He did mostly strength training by wrestling with some domesticated polar bear dogs. Most of the animals in this world were very weird. He didn't say anything or act unusually. For some time, and a couple of days passed, which made everyone understand what had happened to the men who went on the secret mission. Sokka was doing push-ups training his strength. Katara came to him and she had a worried look on her face. Are you doing okay? He stopped at her question and stood up, even through all of that rigorous exercise, he was barely sweating. Not because he wasn't tired, but Gamer's body helped him a lot to keep his body at its peak and ready to fight. Game characters rarely sweat or get tired even when they do, the fundamental logical human body rules that apply to them. Sokka had done quite a lot of research, every day he tried to learn a new thing about the gamer interface. Having a special ability and not knowing everything about it was a danger in and of itself. Come on now. Sister, he smiled brightly, and put his arm around her shoulders, causing Kiwi, the little fox to pop its head from under Katara's clothes. Sokka smiled at the little fox and petted her slightly. There is my cute little guy. It's a girl. I already told you that, Katara reminded him. Also, what are you doing with her? Hum. I thought you didn't like Kiwi. She narrowed her eyes suspiciously. Sokka being nice to someone with a genuine demeanor made Katara be on guard. She was waiting for the inevitable punchline, which would reveal his sinister plans. Okay, maybe I am being a little critical of him. But unless it is sarcastically, my brother will never be nice to someone. The way he is acting right now is even more suspicious than usual. Her mind worked fast faster than it had ever before, as she tried to look at an angle. And what was he aiming at here? Sokka on the other hand was reminded of a dog he had back home. He liked pets quite a lot, opposite of what his usual demeanor showed. I like Kiwi. 
Plus she has grown a little and looks kinder like a dog. Dog. She was confused, not understanding what kind of animal was called that. Think of it like a polar bear dog, but smaller and much, much cuter. Sokka explained it in a way she could understand. Most of this world's animals were some kind of hybrid and some that weren't. I like dogs. I don't think you have ever seen a real dog in your life. And you haven't seen a mountain of gold. But that doesn't mean you wouldn't like having it. He debuted her while thinking that he should get a pet after this war is over. Maybe a cat. He had seen a couple of normal cats in the Earth Kingdom. Anyway, the Southern Water Tribe will be quite nice when we go back. I have this amazing plan. Katara stared at him, trying to figure out what her brother was thinking, or why he was telling her this. But once again, she was unable to see any logical way about what he was up to. Do you want to see some new waterbending moves that I learned from Paku? Oh wow, that sounds amazing. Can't wait for that, he declared sarcastically. Though Sokka didn't have anything better to do right now, and was waiting for a certain someone to come and find him. Though Katara heard the sarcasm, she smiled smugly and started showing off her waterbending moves, and her brother looked on with a contemplative look. Bash Katara POV damn it. He wasn't getting annoyed at all. Finally, after learning to keep calm after his provocative words that usually annoyed me to no end, I thought I could get the upper hand and annoy him back. But Sokka always seems unfazed by the things around him. Katara. Have you ever wondered what you will do after the war is over? Or even in the future? He suddenly inquired, catching me off guard. The future? I never really thought of it. We weren't sure of even beating the Fire Nation, or how to stop them. Much less about things after the war. The far future. I don't know if we will have any future if the Fire Nation wins. Especially since the Avatar's companions are bound to be eternal enemies of the Fire Nation. Never really thought about it. There are enough things we have on our plate right now. My dream for the longest time has been to find a waterbending teacher, and I was finally able to get that. Sokka nodded and he laid down on the cold icy ground. Though he was wearing a jacket, it was bound to be cold. But he didn't seem bothered by it at all. You should think about it more. You have one life, so don't waste it and let others control your life. Even those who love you can unconsciously waste your time, so be careful. They will love you, but they won't care about your time. He had something in his mind that was bothering him, but I knew that he wouldn't tell me. Sokka seems to be keeping some secrets as of late, and wasn't ashamed to show it to me that he was hiding something. Still, I was a little nervous about how this war would end up, because while the people seemed to address Sokka as a hero for saving them, war was dangerous, not something you could play at. Even though I had started seeing the crack in the system, the Northern Water Tribe had no chance of winning this war. Unless Un entered the Avid Estate or something like that. But even then it would be dangerous. I somewhat know how strong Arm was in his Avid Estate, but have never seen him battle against an army that would throw flaming boulders at him. That would be impossible even for the Avatar. In his first life, Sokka had been quite perceptive, a skill that he had developed during the failure that was his acting career. That failure was something that he was glad had happened, sometimes failing was a good thing too. Since then he had been able to read the general mood of someone. In this world, his perception had gotten better, having to sharpen such insight even more. Because here, he had to deal with malicious people daily. While in his last world, the most he had to deal with was a co-worker trying to one-up him, or a manager stealing his efforts, and presenting them as if they were the manager's ideas. The world was cruel on both sides, but one side stood more prominent, lawless. While gamer interface didn't help anyone with something like not being naive, it rewarded behavior that wasn't stupid. Sokka liked to consider himself who at least wasn't stupid. Anyway, think about your future a little more, Sokka advised her, before getting up and walking away having caught sight of the location of the person he was waiting for. Sometimes, even contemplating it can save you from tragedies. Don't let your future become something others decide for you. Katara gazed at his back as he walked off, and asked him, What about you? Have you ever thought about your future? Of course. He nodded, a small smirk making its way into his face. Katara could tell that he was smirking, even though she couldn't see his face. I have everything planned, even my death. He muttered the last part quietly. But she still heard him. Sometimes, things might not go to plan. But you just need to adjust and adapt to situations. Make sure you plan everything carefully then. Katara pouted, acting annoyed at his words. Though she listened to them very closely. If you fall down, I will be there for you too. You are that's cringe. Sokka turned around and looked at her as if he had swallowed a lemon. He seemed to have been hurt inside due to her words. I got second-hand embarrassment just listening to them. I learned to speak this way from you. Bastard. She chased him off. Katara was annoyed, this time for real. But Sokka was fast, and it seemed like he had multiple legs, like a squid as he ran off. In the end, she was left breathing heavily, with her brother nowhere in sight. Sokka stood atop one of the roofs after losing Katara, and he looked down at the person he had been waiting for. It was Arnok, the chieftain, he stood tall and tried to look respectable. But Sokka could see through him like an x-ray. He noticed that Arnok had lost some weight, appetite changes, maybe. 
Since he seemed thin, energetic, and judging by his half-closed eyes and yawn, it seemed like he had slept less too. Or maybe he hadn't slept at all. Appetite and weight changes. Changes in sleep habits. Less optimistic than others. Loss of concentration. Disinterested in his hobbies. Those were the signs that someone was depressed. Sokka couldn't prove the last point, he was still quite confident in his assessment as Arnok fit most of the descriptions. Sokka knew just how vulnerable one could be in this position. Normal people could be depressed, but a leader never must or else he will be taken advantage of. Right now, Sokka wasn't feeling too kind as the more dangerous the situation became, the more ruthless he would become. Now wasn't the time to be nice. So with that in mind, he jumped down and approached the chieftain with nefarious thoughts in his mind. Dead, they are all dead. Every single one of the warriors that I had sent is dead. My naivety got everyone killed. Not only the elders but also some of the promising younger generation were dead. Han was amongst them too. You must be devastated at her betrothed's death. How can I face her now? Arnok beat himself over the decision he made. His body felt like it was falling apart from the stress. While he had been worried about pleasing everyone, he failed to take into account people's lives, and that this was a war, not a political battle. Only Paku now and the Northern Water Tribe could be called a true waterbending master. While he was the best amongst any of the elders, one man could only do so much. Arnok held hope that maybe they were still alive, but he had learned better. The experience of dealing with a war was quickly dawning on him. While walking down the road, he almost felt sick to his stomach when he stumbled into Sokka who was waiting for him in a secluded place with very few people. Hello, he greeted the chieftain cheerfully and waved. I see that you're troubled, chieftain. I can deal with all of your problems. Sokka's words and gentle smile were meant to disarm anyone. He was like the helpful neighbor boy. You know, I have some knowledge on situations like these. If you leave everything to me, then I will take care of it. Have someone else do the bothersome things for you. They will help you and they will be your comrade with seemingly no benefits to them. Sounds good, right? Sadly, reality wasn't that bland. People were complex, and everyone had their ambitions. Sokka was taking advantage of the depressed and sleep-deprived chieftain. Even Arnok knew. If he didn't know now, he would in the future. The chieftain stared down at the ground. He wanted to sleep, he wanted to be with you, and help her through this hard time. His heart clenched at the thought of his daughter, she was scared. This guy is either having mental degradation due to the lack of sleep, or he was that desperate. Maybe both. Ash thought Sokka, playing the act of a helpful young man. Whether Arnok could see through this or not didn't matter. Desperate people sometimes clouded themselves to believe what they wanted to believe. There was a reason why so many people fell for scam calls. Then, fix it, Arnok muttered, his voice filled with a strange optimism in them. His reaction made Sokka suspicious. But he didn't think about it too much. He clapped his hands to bring the attention of the chieftain to him. Well, I am not your dog though. So how about a deal that is beneficial for both of us? You didn't listen to my plan the first time. So now I have no reason to listen to you for free. What do you want? The chieftain inquired. He didn't act like he was here to negotiate, but just compromise. It unnerved Sokka a little at just how vulnerable people could become when desperate. Will I one day end up like that too? Everyone could end up as shit on the side of the road one day. Sokka didn't want that to happen, especially since he knew that his situation wasn't as good as it appeared, and he knew that. Still, he played it as everything was okay, and the smile on his face didn't falter. Though he promised himself to not act like a fool when the time came. Arnok was worried about what would happen when the Fire Nation took over, and what would happen to you. These thoughts made his mood worse. I want supplies, food, workers, and protection be sent over to the Southern Water Tribe. Sokka stated what he wanted, and his tone made it clear that there was no room for negotiation. If you promise me that and we get it on paper, then I will agree. Arnok nodded, expressing his agreement to the deal. Sokka had to try hard to keep his smile down, since in his wording, he had been vague and never mentioned how much quantity of food and other things they would have sent to the tribe. Normally such vague words could be used by someone like Arnok, who was in power to dodge or negotiate down the deal. But being the chieftain would only put him at a disadvantage when Sokka became the hero of the Northern Water Tribe. Sokka had a very detailed idea of how things would go, and while he predicted how this situation might play out, he also knew that some things could and would go wrong. But now, he had an incentive to win, a benefit, a reason, and that was a motivation that would push him. Though during the ordeal, Arnok didn't try to negotiate. This surprised him a little. After all, just because someone had a tone like they didn't want to negotiate didn't mean that you shouldn't try to talk with them. To Sokka, it made sense, since the Northern Water Tribe didn't have any trade with the outside world. This was a nice surprise to him, like a birthday gift. But Sokka was a little disappointed at how incompetent the ruling power of the North was. Like a shark, Sokka smelled blood at this incompetence, and showing weakness in front of someone like him wasn't a good idea. Also, the North won't intervene in the politics of the South even after this war is over. Of course, I will need that in writing too. This time Arnok through his tired eyes frowned. The North had been ruling the Southern Water Tribe for Dash. But you haven't been ruling it for a hundred years now, and they have lost a lot of manpower due to the war, and now it is a poor region, a shadow of its former self. Sokka reasoned, as his smile slowly started turning into a frown. He wasn't really annoyed, but had to play his part. The Northern Water Tribe will be destroyed without me. 
Are you sure you want that? The Southern Water Tribe will just be an economic wormhole. Do you want to have to keep sending supplies on the other side of the world for a long time? The journey itself is expensive as hell, people don't do all that for free. He made sure to make Anuk think that the deal was beneficial for both of them. So the chieftain wouldn't feel like he was being screwed over because he was. Sokka knew that the Southern Water Tribe would become rich, as it had the biggest oil reserves. But at this time no one knew about it. And he made it sure in his wording, that he included the whole South Pole wouldn't be interfered with, not just the Southern Tribe. These kinds of things were good to make clear early on. So in the future, when problems start arising, he will have the deal to his side. Intelligence increased by one, for making a good deal that outsmarted the other side well. I am not exactly screwing him over. Technically, Arnok sighed, but in the end nodded agreeing with this deal too. In his eyes, the Southern Water Tribe would be a never-ending money sink. Overall it was cruel to think of it that way. But he was glad that Sokka was taking this out of his hands. I agree. The paperwork will be done. And we will both make a blood fingerprint on the contract. That will be held for now. Until the end of time. Jeez. Look at these theatrics. Well. I guess they are very old fashioned and think things like these are still cool. Sokka kept his thoughts to himself. And didn't utter a word about his thoughts. Instead. He just smiled and shook the tired chieftain's hand. Glad we could work this out. Now go and rest. I will take care of things from here on out. Arnok walked off to be with his family and his posture was that of a defeated man even though he tried to keep the illusion that he was okay. The world around him was filled with uncertainties, but Sokka knew better than to panic. The coldness around him seemed to sink into his skin, but he stood tall, unwavering, breathing out a hot cloud from his mouth. What a sad situation, for a split second, Sokka allowed himself to feel pity for Arnok. But he understood that this had to be done, things were becoming complicated, and the best he could do was take care of the people close to him. The prey, or the predator, I wonder which one I am. Looking at the sky, Sokka saw the clouds slowly moving. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath riding any thoughts of hesitation in his mind. He walked along the road, silently, but quickly at the same time. Arriving atop the wall, he looked at the sky once again, and saw that it was dark. Soon the full moon would become purely visible. After writing these documents, he knew what had to be done. Human moves for their benefits. If there was nothing to be gained, life wouldn't be worth living. Sokka wanted to go and immediately pressure Anuk into signing the papers, but decided to let the man spend some time with his daughter. Yu was someone whose demeanor reminded him of someone in his past life. He was reminded of a bloody bathtub every time he looked at her. Though he mellowed out later on in life, during his younger years, he wasn't nice at all. Harsh environments always grew strong people, survivors, and those kinds of people weren't nice most of the time. He waited for a couple hours, standing there while staring at the Fire Nation Navy, hundreds, possibly thousands of ships stood. Even with the gamer interface, that was something Sokka couldn't deal with. But he never was someone who would give up so easily. It wasn't like he had to fight against the enemy head on. Sokka used a minor trick with his waterbending and made an ice cube that perfectly fit in his hand. He compressed the ice, making it more rigid and stringer and the sparkle that it gave off was like that of a diamond. Sokka. Suddenly Katara's voice rang out as she had walked up the stairs and stood next to him, overlooking the Fire Nation Navy. The chieftain called for you and has requested Arn as a witness. Did something happen? Her voice showed that she was worried about him. But Sokka dismissed such thoughts of hers with a gentle smile, fondly clasping her cheek. No, don't worry. I have everything under control. I will make life in the Southern Water Tribe amazing. At first, Katara glanced at him questionably, as if confused by what he had said. She only smiled, feeling the gentleness that he usually never showed. You don't have to worry either. As your sister, I will be by your side too. So stop being so sad. Sad. Sokka hadn't noticed he was making that kind of expression. But he wasn't worried, since Katara was the one who saw this side of him too. Cold, sarcastic, kind. Which side was his real one? All of them were him. Sokka dismissed any distracting thought that came to mind and patted his sister on the head, before walking away with a smile on his face. He was back to normal as if nothing ever happened, as if he hadn't revealed something he considered a weakness to his sister. As he walked towards Arnok's home, the people looked at him and talked in whispered tones. Sokka didn't mind it and took this with stride, smiling at everyone, he felt as if a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. Once he arrived at his destination, he saw Arnok's humble home. It had one floor, with no extravagant decorations on it either, and from the outside, it seemed like something a middle-class family family would own. The windows were made out of something that seemed like transparent ice, and it made Sokka curious if they were made using water bending. He walked in without hesitation, and even inside, the house was humble, with a small table in the middle for four people. A small stone stove on the corner had something cooking within it. Sokka took a deep breath in the house, and felt the cold air permanente his lungs, like everywhere else in the North Pole. The place was cold. Arn was sitting nervously in one of the chairs. It was clear with his nudging that the young airbender was uncomfortable. He saw Sokka and waved at him. Hey, we haven't been able to see each other a lot lately. Do you know why the chieftain has called us here? Sokka shrugged, acting as if he had no idea. Where is you? That was another question he had an answer to but decided to act clueless. The map was a very convenient tool to have. Sokka. Yu's voice sounded out in excitement before him, and her rushing steps were heard before her hug. That made him almost stumble forward. T. 
Turning around, he smiled at her and hugged you, engulfing her in his arms. Have you gotten better? Yes, she stated excitedly as color seemed to come to her face. You seemed happier than she had been since the explosion. I knew my good looks would bring anyone back to good health, soccer jokes. Looking you in the eyes, as his smile dampened a little. Take better care of yourself, or I will be worried. Once again, Sokka said another lie without missing a beat. By now, you had outlived her usefulness, and there was nothing that could be gained from her. But he decided to help her. Why? Because he wanted to. There wasn't some deep meaning to it, nor a benefit. You giggled, in turn, hugging him even tighter. Arn looked at the table awkwardly, feeling like a third wheel. That was when Arnok came into the house and saw Sokka and you hugging each other, both with smiles on their faces. Sokka looked back at Arnok, and the old man narrowed his eyes. This made Sokka wonder if this could lead to the destruction of their relationship. But that thought disappeared as soon as it came. Even if the father wanted to be angry, he couldn't. The situation was in Sokka's favor, and if one was as powerless as Arnok, he couldn't do anything. Also, you didn't seem to be angry, and instead appeared to be happy. There was no sign of her previous fear. Arnok could do nothing but sigh. I am glad that you seem happy. Did you eat anything today? Sokka smiled. The situation didn't escalate at levels that it could have, and with you going to get whatever food was on the stone stove. He sat down next to Arn, with the chieftain sitting opposite of them. Sokka's heartbeat increased rapidly, but he calmed down, reasoning that there was no reason to be nervous. While he had carefully thought out the plan, he didn't know whether it would be something the chieftain would accept. Had he noticed the loopholes in the contract, was there something he had missed? Even while such thoughts started plaguing his mind, Sokka kept calm and acted accordingly, casually sitting on the chair as Arnok pulled out a contract that was several pages long. Well, I have thought about everything, and have decided to accept your terms. Sokka almost jumped up in excitement as a smile seemed to make its way into his face. I am glad that we could agree, chieftain. Arnok nodded, smiling back. The atmosphere in the room seemed to change into a pleasant one. Ah, uh, what am I supposed to do here? Arn asked, fidgeting awkwardly. Sokka took the papers and handed them over to him. He later on planned to teach the young avatar about life and how to deal with situations like these. While Arn had the potential to save the world, sometimes the world didn't want to be saved and peace wasn't so easy to be held. Sokka knew how to hold peace, and weapons aren't that useful during times of peace. But pen and paper are. Read them carefully, Sokka advised him. With the avatar here, the deal would last at least until Korra's reign, and have validity till then. Of course, he predicted that the Northern Water Tribe would get overwhelmed by greed. Well, not the whole tribe, but those in leadership positions would be filled with greed. From today onward, this deal would hold out for as long as Sokka did whatever he could to stop the Fire Nation. If he didn't, then the deal was void. At what seemed from the surface level of the contract, there was no big drawback, as the Northern Water Tribe wouldn't have to give anything to the Southern Tribe if the former was invaded. Sokka knew that the best way to make a deal look enticing to the opposite side was to make sure the other party didn't feel like it wasn't screwed over. As the avatar, you will be the witness on the deal made today, Arnok stated, and Arn was overwhelmed by the situation and agreed. Arnok, you old bastard. You are more manipulative than you look. Sokka contemplated, others might have dismissed Arnok's words as something said casually, but he had just essentially said, remember this if your part of the deal fails, we aren't sending anything to the Southern Water Tribe. It always made Sokka wonder just how someone so soft-spoken like Arnok was in such a position of power. But then it came to his mind, he wasn't soft-spoken. He remembered how in the original Avatar timeline after the 100-year war was over, this same man had orchestrated with the other elders, a slow but sure influence in the Southern Water Tribe, trying to steal the oil in there, and take the place over. How could someone soft spoken become a chieftain, getting married to the previous chieftain's daughter. There was no way everything was as easy as it seemed. History would never mention these things, but there were bound to be many guys aiming for the previous chieftain's daughter. It was clear that while Arnok was incompetent when it came to matters of war, he knew what needed to be done. Should I kill him now? Better than to let him grow and become someone that might become troublesome. Sokka glanced at the chieftain as he thought about how to kill off the man, but decided to not go through with it as someone else would take his place anyway. Is something wrong, Sokka? Inquired Arn curiously. Sokka shook his head with a harmless smile on his face. No, it's nothing. Just thinking of a way to take care of this problem. As the night came about, the last full moon stood in the sky. After tonight there won't be another full moon in quite a while. Sokka stood atop the wall that had protected the Northern Water Tribe for many years. He could feel the biting cold in his skin, but didn't mind it. Any kind of pain just showed that he was alive. He was wearing dark clothes and a fasimus where only his eyes were shown. His spear sky piercer in hand. Two other people also stood next to him. They wore similar clothes, and their builds were lean and built for agility. One of them was a waterbender and the other a warrior. But they all had one thing in common and were similar in size. And when masked, it was hard to tell which was which. In the dark, they seemed the same with these disguises on. This was done intentionally by Sokka. Remember, we will only address each other A, B and C. Not at any point must real names be mentioned, Sokka reminded them. He was A, while the waterbenders was B, and the last warrior was C. This was all made so Azala wouldn't know who they were. Let's go. After saying that, Sokka jumped towards the water and the other two followed him. He could feel the cold wind hit his body. 
But he didn't mind though a trace of cautiousness sneaked into his heart. Since she had been recently attacked, would she still be on guard? It depended on how much she trusted Kuzan, because if she trusted in his abilities too much, then she would think that he would be able to see through this too. E. The waterbenders created a bubble in the eater and an ice footing, so they could surf underwater. Sokka looked at the dome of water as they landed and went under it. Even though he could do something like this himself, it didn't mean that he wasn't impressed by it. He loved bending or any kind of other fantasy power anyone coming from a normal world would. They stealthily arrived at the main Fire Nation ship, and as Sokka landed on the deck, he saw a couple of soldiers standing guard. His finger trailed to the back of their necks and he softly used Kai blocking before anyone noticed anything, and they were knocked out. What was that? He looked on in surprise, never having seen such a takedown before. Sokka shook his hand and made a shushing motion to keep quiet and not say anything. He was the first one to look around and feel like something was strange. He looked at Sokka and mentioned that there were too few guards around here for a royal ship. Sokka nodded, he had noticed this too, and he got an answer. Lightning crackles rang out, looking up, Sokka saw Azula on the highest point of the ship, looking down at them, and she already had her fingers pointed at them. He moved as fast as he could, grabbing the two people that had come with him. Sokka dodged out of the way of the lighting. Boom, a loud explosion rang out, and while the two people that came with him were disoriented, Sokka was fully on guard and threw them to the side. Crackle lightning sounds rang out again. But since his view was obscured due to the smoke, he couldn't see where it was exactly coming from. Pulling out the map would block his field of vision more too, so Sokka opted for a better option. He closed his eyes and let his sense danger skill to sense the attack. Tilting his head, lightning passed right past him, and the loud cracking of the electricity hit his ears, and some small veins of electricity licked his skin, ripping the lower right side of his mark. But Sokka was quick to pull another mask from his inventory and covered his face. You thought you were a predator, but you're a prey all along, Azula remarked. And her voice was like a little girl who was breaking her dolls apart and enjoying it. You're pretty good. I thought a human couldn't be able to dodge lightning from such an angle. You sensed it for about one second before it hit you and dodged. Amazing. Sokka swung his spear, creating a small wing and clearing up the dust around him. He caught sight of Azula and noticed that Mai and Tai Lee were next to her. If I remember correctly, you should be Princess Azula of the Fire Nation. Oh, it seems like you have learned something from the Avatar, she smoked mockingly. It's an honor to have someone as great as him remember me. Her voice was dripping with sarcasm, but Sokka didn't mind it too much. You're pretty, kinda hard to forget that. Oh, is that so? Well, sorry but I'm already taken, she chuckled, and she shot out two lightning bolts from her fingers. Sokka didn't dodge, and let the attacks hit him. Even if he dodged, it would just turn into a game of cat and mouse. One that he would lose, since Azula had prepared quite well. She had distance and all. E-Z-Z-Z-T. Electricity traveled through his body, shocking his blood burning his burns. The degree was so high that it could have paralyzed anyone else. He slumped on the ground, and the soldiers started walking forward to capture him. B and C who were with him looked around in fear. While the warrior was ready to fight, the waterbender was ready to run away. He didn't want to die here. Stop. Azula warned the Fire Nation soldiers, narrowing her eyes at Sokka. You can get up. I know better than to fall for a trap like that. Next time try and act like you're in pain, and you don't seem burned at all. A sigh came out of Sokka. He got up and dusted himself. Sheesh. I hate enemies who think these things through and catch on to small details. Sokka stared at Azula standing up there, and he had many ways to get there, but knew that she probably prepared many things to stop him from doing that. He could also use his teleportation boots, but he didn't want to waste a usage of theirs, or expose his gamer powers. Well, he had another plan on how to deal with this. I see, so you have a spy in the Northern Tribe. Sokka smiled maliciously, Azula didn't show anything more than a small twitch in her eye. When I go back to the tribe, I will make sure to kill and torture him to death. His screams filled with pain will ring through the night. A blue blast of fire shot towards Sokka, but the waterbender teammate made himself used and pulled a stream of water and blocked the fire. It was Sokka's turn to look Azula in the eyes with a knowing gaze. Oh, no lightning anymore. I heard that you need to be controlled to use lightning. It's called the cold-blooded fire for a reason. So that must mean that you're super pissed off. Azula's eyes turned cold. Unlike before where she milked him, she was different. Tai Lee, my, we are killing him. Tai Lee flinched. She had never felt Azula's aura grow so cold and angry at the same time. I will show him torture. Well, I have nothing to do until the new moon passes. Seems like this guy will help me pass time. Oh, so I was right. You have a spy in our tribe, and you must care about him quite a lot. Sokka licked his lip as he activated the acting skill and made sure to express his emotions into Azula. I will enjoy myself while killing this boyfriend of yours. Now I also learned from you that he is a boy. This will make it easier to find him. Azula at first didn't do anything, but she clenched her fist until her nails sank into her palm and drew blood. Her eyes become bloodshot and she jumped down. I will kill you, Azula. No, Mai yelled out. But it was too late. She had fallen for her enemy's ruse. Don't worry Mai, I can deal with them. Ty Lee, come and help me, just in case. Azula was still somewhat calm. Lightning crackled around her, and her hair floated upward. Lightning may be called the cold-blooded fire, 
but only amateurs can't use it when they are angry. E Z Z Z Z Z Z T T T T T O really. Then your soon to be dear boyfriend will be happy that you have come so far. Sokka seemed to hit every button to anger Azula. What a crazy bitch Azula was something else. The look she gave me made my heart feel like a frozen bag of ice. What a scary chick. E Z Z Z Z Z T she shot lightning at point blank. But I dodged easier than before. The normal Azula would have shot fire to cloud my sight and then shoot lightning even if I knew what she would do. I wouldn't be able to dodge it. She seemed angry and slightly panicked. That was enough to stop her from making the best possible move with each attack. If she wasn't fighting me at her best, the difference between us fwish. Within an instant, I was within her inner zone, and lightning couldn't protect her as my spear slashed through her midsection, drawing an arc of blood in the air. The difference between us is too large. Fighting against a stronger opponent recklessly wasn't how you did it. You needed to plan and exploit a weakness. Essentially, by gaming turns, it's called spamming one move in camping. Azula, Tai Lee yelled out worriedly and rushed towards her friend. Mai threw a couple of weapons at me but I casually picked them off the air, making sure to not let them puncture my skin, as I could tell that there was some deadly poison in them. Hey, you might hurt somebody by throwing these things. I warned her, with Azula injured, no one in this place would be able to stop me. Unless Ira was here, I could kill everyone in here before reinforcements from the other ships arrived. Though if I wanted to kill everyone, then I would use waterbending. But killing everyone in my way wasn't the answer. With my identity as Sokka, Azula probably hated me. But as Kuzan she might have other thoughts. I had bigger plans for her, and she has a bigger role to play. For someone like her to die so early, it would be a shame. Killing her would be the same as killing an abused child. I turned around and went towards the two down men. The waterbender was barely conscious, but I made sure he saw what happened. Jumping into the water, I was greeted by extreme cold. But even while holding two people in my back, I swam away like a dolphin. Swimming skill was something else. The thought of killing Azula did pass my mind for a split second. After all, she was growing more intelligent each day. And with me there, she will grow up to become a force to be reckoned with. But if she was on my side, that would change everything. If I don't succeed in this, I will have a very powerful enemy to deal with in the future. Sokka's body started feeling the cold quite badly, and he started losing health points due to hypothermia. Since it was night, the water was especially cold. Just the burning pain of the ice-cold waters would have made someone pass out and want to give up. Sokka had a little advantage as while Gamer's body didn't cancel pain completely, but it still helped. After arriving at the walls, there was no one waiting for him. But Sokka didn't mind and took two daggers out of his pockets and started climbing, with the two people tied to him. These days it feels like I am always carrying everything. He muttered a little annoyed at having to do something like this. Still, even while climbing he kept an eye on the Fire Nation ships. None of them had moved. I thought they would attack me by now. But it seems like Azula is still conscious and giving good orders. To him, it was quite fascinating to see people grow. Even the original Azula would have attacked him by now with all of her forces. But now, she held them back, knowing that attacking right now would only lead to unnecessary casualties. What a smart girl. He grunted pushing himself over the top of the wall and dragging the now unconscious bodies up. You two fuckers, if it wasn't to have you witness my deeds. I wouldn't keep two useless pieces of baggage around. E and B, both of which Sokka didn't bother to remember or check the real names of, had been there to just keep watch over what would happen. They were useless to Sokka in battle. Azula had been expecting them, and they ended up becoming baggage. Amidst the cold night winds of the north, except for some guards, no one else was there to see Sokka carry two limp people over his shoulder. He walked into the chieftain's house and dropped his helpers on the ground like a sack of potatoes, and sat on the chair. Sokka went and lit a fire on the stove, making himself at home. It's cold as hell these days. Do you go into every house and use their charcoal. Arnold came out of his bedroom, fully clothed. He looked healthier, and he didn't seem that worried anymore. It made Sokka wonder if something good happened. Noticing the two unconscious, shaking bodies on the floor, the chieftain frowned. I think you should take them to the healing huts or they will die. Get someone else to do it. I hauled them throughout the ocean, swimming in cold water while carrying two people is hard. I am tired. Sokka explained, without missing a beat, even though due to Gamer's body. He wasn't tired at all. Anyway, I am here to explain what happened. Princess Azula is the leader of the ships, she is young, but not naive. Honestly, I would rather have anyone else in charge than her. But I injured her heavily, and the injuries should take a couple of weeks to heal. Sokka didn't say the whole truth, but even Anuk couldn't refute his explanation. Azula was too injured for battle, and the chances that she would participate in the war were slim to none. This would help tremendously, she was too competent to allow her to be in the field of battle, and see the fight directly. Anyway, I have done my part now, you will hold your end of the deal, right? Sokka asked nicely, but Anuk could see the sharpness in the young man's eyes. If he refused the deal, he felt like something bad might happen. Arnok nods, but doesn't give a definitive answer. Instead, he sits in front of Sokka, leaning his arms on the tables as his elbows brush past the hardwood. So, what would happen if we are unable to offer what we promised? Sokka raised a questioning brow at that. In the original story, Arnok had been quite willing to help. Since helping the Southern Water Tribe was like helping themselves, they controlled the damn thing 
and wanted to get into the good graces of the people. How do you get in favor with hungry and poor people? Offer them food. It was a simple solution. So, I don't think such a thing is relevant for now. Sokka shook his head with a good-natured smile on his face. The initial bombs destroyed a lot of the food storage we had, Arnold clarified. People will starve if I offer my part of the deal. How about we split the deal into parts? and we pay you in a period over 10 or so years. You don't want people to starve, do you? Your people are starving. That's sad. Wotsoka shook his head, looking at the chieftain with a sympathetic look. Well, I am sure you guys can handle it. After all, we did make a deal. Yes, but are you cruel enough to do this to starving people? It's not like I am unwilling to pay you. It's just that we are a little tight on food right now. Anuk reasoned. The leader looked sad while staring at the table. This made Sokka frown because, for the first time, he wasn't able to tell what the chieftain in front of him was thinking. Usually, until now, Anuk had an opening, a guard down, or was depressed, putting him in a weakened state where someone like Sokka could read him like an open book. There will always be politics, wherever I go. Well, I do not mind them too much. Sokka complained internally, in his mind, but in the end, he shook his head and sighed. Listen, how should I say this in a nice way? He looked at the ceiling. When you made the deal, you should have thought of your supplies before accepting. Back then, I didn't know and was tired. My mind wasn't at its best. Arnok tried to express his remorse, but Sokka wasn't buying it. Unlike Arn, he wasn't a pushover. They had a deal, and he also had people to protect. In truth, Sokka didn't know if Arnok was lying. He might be for all he knew, but even if it wasn't, it didn't matter to him. He knew that not getting food for his tribe would end up with many of them emigrating after the war. Listen, I don't care. In the end, Sokka decided to be direct. He didn't want to negotiate this for days. We had a deal, and I want the reward sent home as soon as possible. Arnok narrowed his eyes. What if I don't? Your friends with the Avatar doing anything bad could end up dash. You have a beautiful daughter. Sokka's eyes turned deadly cold. It would be a shame for anything to happen to her. The chieftain's eyes widened in shock. Arnok couldn't believe what he just heard. Did you just threaten me? Of course not. But if the reward you promised doesn't come through, well, young girls die all the time, just slip and break their pretty necks. After saying that, Sokka got up, concluding his discussion. He made it clear what kind of person he was. Stop. Arnok yelled, making the young southern tribe boy turn around, his cold gaze still apparent in his eyes. Boy, don't you dare threaten my family. Remember where you are. Sokka only smiled. He knew that the old man was trying to insinuate that they had Katara here. If something happened to you, then his sister would end up meeting the same fate. But Sokka didn't mind at all. Then you should remember who the people like more. Titles don't give you magical power. And a civil war would be bad during these times. People loved Sokka. They thought him to be a competent young man. And he knew that. If he bid for the chieftain's removal or incompetence, not everyone would agree. But having a civil war within the walls wasn't a good idea for now. Arnok sighed in disappointment. To him this was just a negotiation. But Sokka turned it into much more. I will destroy him. That was the one thought that ran through Sokka's head. Arnok had proven himself untrustworthy. And he needed someone to take the reins in the Northern Water Tribe. That was somewhat trusting. He didn't need to be friendly. Just someone who held his part of the deal. Sokka had been playing around with these D-folk for long enough and he didn't plan to keep doing so for too long. As the last full moon settled past the sea, the sun rose, and every waterbender and warrior on the tribe stood ready. The Fire Nation ships raised their anchors and started moving. It seemed like there was no end to them, hundreds no, thousands of ships. Sokka was amidst the people in the wall and stretched casually amongst the nervous soldiers. He seemed to be very relaxed. Guys, once we kill these Fire Nation soldiers, do you want to have a drinking contest? I have a fish I caught today and perfectly salted it. I can't wait to go back. By the way, if any of you survive, let's eat some of that fish together. Sharing is caring. Ding. New quest. Save the North. Sokka dismissed the notification after accepting it. He didn't care about quests too much, as he would do what he wanted, and knew that letting himself be controlled by these notifications wasn't a smart thing to do. By the way, if we die, you owe me some money. The soldiers chuckled at his words. Sokka smiled. Joke's on you. We will all die one day. So you still owe me. See, that's how you make a deal. You got screwed. That's why I'm gonna live, and not let you eat even a piece of fish. A soldier finally got the courage to speak with a smile on his face. Fuck that, go and die you bastard, nobody's touching my salted fish. Sokka said, insistent in keeping his fish. Fuck you Sokka, I am getting some of that salted fish no matter what, another guy added. Katara, who was among the soldiers, frowned in confusion. What crude words. Arm, on the other hand, looked on in admiration. He is amazing. Everyone has forgotten why they were so nervous. He makes it look so easy, calming them down in seconds. Sokka of course didn't hear any of this, and was concentrated with the fleet. He frowned when he noticed only one ship coming towards them faster than the others. It wasn't the royal ship and confused Sokka why that one ship was coming closer faster than the others. It would be a death wish for the members in it to do so. Suddenly, like a lightning bolt, an idea struck him. 
Oh Azala, you came up with another amazing plan. Though his words sounded mocking towards the princess to anyone who heard him. In reality, he was executed, hoping that Azala would end up on his side. Having someone like her with him would have this war be won with almost 100% certainty. Simply killing Oza won't end the war. It wasn't that simple. But these things can be solved differently. Sokka's mind moved at speeds never thought before as he saw the ship approaching. Everyone, get off the wall. Usually, people would believe that the enemy made a mistake and sent a lone ship which was the same as putting your hand in a lion's mouth. The enemy making a mistake would make the opponent seem incompetent, who didn't want to believe that their enemy was incompetent. That sense of relief, happiness, and hope, but Sokka was no fool. While he didn't know if Azala was even conscious due to the injuries she gave her, but there was one thing he was sure of, Azala was vindictive enough to not allow her men to do something stupid like this. The people hurriedly got down from the wall, and Sokka did too. As soon as the ship got close and touched the wall, his sense danger skill flared like never before. Boom, the walls crumbled like paper, and everyone looked on in shock. If they hadn't moved, then most of the army would have died. Even the giant debris that started raining down would have killed many. But the waterbenders stood guard and handled huge chunks of ice. That used to be part of the wall, and turned them into water. Um, also made sure you try and help everyone, pushing them out of the way of an attack. Soon the ships moved at top speeds and docked. Now it was time for war. The wall, the one that had been the biggest defense, that had held back since millennia against outsider attacks, had crumbled down. In truth, Sokka wasn't even surprised. Azala had a history with walls, and they were never able to keep her out if she wanted something. Ash Arnott POV Even though I was in the back of the army, I felt the heat lick my skin like a fire lizard cat's tongue. Sokka's warning had saved the army, or we would have been defeated without being able to put up a worthy fight otherwise. But there stood Sokka, looking at the explosion with no fear in his stance. I was jealous of him, to say the least. He was also someone I had to be cautious towards. While I kept getting older every day, he was at the peak of his youth powerful, smarter, and everything I lacked he had. He might have been a good match for you, but he isn't someone I wanted anywhere near close to her. Sokka has shown that if I got in his way, he was willing to go after my family. There is no doubt in my mind that if he marries you, and secures the position of the future chieftain, I will have an accident on his behalf. I have never met someone so dangerous in my life, and knew that it was only a matter of time before he became a danger. That greed in him, even though he says that he will be satisfied with ruling the Southern Water Tribe, I knew that he would do a good job ruling. Men like him were very competent. How long until his eyes wander north? What worried me, even more, was that Sokka would be the kind of tyrant people would like. What a disaster how do I deal with someone like him? Everyone, stand ready. Yelled out Sokka, as the smell of the oil drafted on his nose, he could almost taste the crude substance. Still, as he saw the Fire Nation ships approaching, and with no wall to keep them out, he knew more distractions could lead down a bad path. Sokka knew he wasn't a naturally good leader. At best, he was just a copy of legendary figures in his past life. He is stealing their ideas and using them as his own in this world. But he knew one way that even someone like him could lead people, and that was to lead by example. I won't let someone do what I am not willing to. Acting injured like and keep going on after a while will improve my public opinion too. So with that in mind, he was the first to charge. He felt the heat rummage through his clothes and dry his skin as a sea of fire was in front of him. Waterbenders, douse these flames down or they will just be fuel for the enemy. Sokka's words vibrated through the air, and the waterbenders listened to his command. He had just saved their lives, and while they were still in that high, they would do anything he ordered them in this war. While the flames settled down, with streams of water dousing them out, three ships had already docked, and many soldiers came out of the ships. Sokka's map was covered in red dots, and he knew that the chances of winning this war had plummeted to rock bottom. But he wasn't giving up yet. While he didn't like the rulers of the North, he needed them in case Arn failed his mission. The next avatar in line would be water, and he didn't want to have it be born in some unknown place. As soon as fire blasts were shot at him, Sokka dipped low and ran like a rat, escaping all the flames, and mercilessly decapitating two Fire Nation soldiers. The first to set foot in the Northern Water Tribe. You should have stayed back home, he warned them as his eyes turned cold. But by now, he was surrounded by fire benders and non-bending Fire Nation soldiers. But even then, he had a smile on his face. The enemy wasn't showing any sign of stopping against him, nor were they fearful. With their overwhelming numbers, which even with the full army not yet all docked, they still outnumbered every soldier of the Northern Water Tribe 1 to 10. Buom! Blasts of smoldering flames are shot at him, forming a giant pyre of flames where he stood. The Fire Nation soldiers were ruthless, just as Princess Azala had ordered them to be. The rock burning heat stood there as a tirade of flames formed. But as the fire cleared out, there was no one there. Did we burn him to ashes? Asked one of the younger firebenders. No, one of the veteran members shook his head. That's not how human bodies burn. There is no smell of flesh either. 
Keep on guard. This guy was the one who was leading this initial team of attackers, and Azula had put him in charge because he was competent. He narrowed his eyes and saw the ice where Sokka stood was cut into a circle, just enough to fit his body underwater. He is underwater. As soon as he yelled out his warning, two hands burst from under the ice, and clasped his hands around the root of the veteran's feet. Crash. The Fire Nation soldiers could do nothing as their commander was pulled underwater, and panic settled upon their hearts. But a couple of other soldiers took command without much problem. Be careful. Make formations as the waterbenders are coming. Get the rhino squad ready. We will dash burst suddenly. Two human hands came out of the ice again and clasped their hands around the feet of one of the new people in command. Shy Dash he didn't get to say any more as he was pulled under the ice, and the water under the translucent hard water became red with blood. He is targeting the commanders, muttered the only one left to command the soldiers. Still, even though he knew what would happen next, the soldier fearlessly glanced at his soldiers. Don't worry. Keep the wall standing and let the rhino troop disengage. We will beat the waterbender just like that. No matter what happens to me. Don't panic Dash, two hands once again burst from the ice, and the man tried to turn them off with his fire bending, even though his own feet were in the hit range of the fire. But before he could injure his attacker he was pulled underwater, and saw a tan skinned young man with shining blue eyes look at him coldly. The commander started regretting his choice, as he didn't want to die, and even had a mother to take care of back home. But he remembered Azula's promise, and knew that his mother would be treated well, and pulled out a dagger, ready to attack. Fwish. But he had no chance as even underwater the man's spear seemed to move at blinding speeds. The commander protected his throat with his dagger, but it was useless, the spear cut cleanly through the metal and slashed his neck. Even if Sokka wasn't able to decapitate him, the man died nonetheless. Above where the soldiers had formed a wall to fight against the incoming waterbenders, and were ready to fight against them just like they had been learning. Princess Azula had spent quite a bit to teach them how to fight against waterbenders, and hadn't wanted the time they had spent anchored outside the walls, while waiting for the full moon to go away. But what none of them noticed was Sokka coming out of the ice from behind them. He let the panicked commander speak, because while the now dead commander was a good leader, he had been panicked. Fwish. With his mighty strength, Sokka swung his spear, creating a rough wind, and killing many Fire Nation soldiers whose backs were turned. Ah, help, monster. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.